Court podcast. Creepy. I'm mad. Creepier. I'm John. Oh, I'm Steve. Okay. Yeah, I'm John. I played along. No, I'm John. This, is my, this is my real voice. Way to play along, Steve. Yeah. I don't know. No. Well, he played along. Nobody so knows. Enough. Yeah. No. Bit. Nobody knows. So she's a bad the trouble. I see. see. See, but now I only hear that in uh, Spaceballs. No, no, oh. rather um, Rowan Atkinson. On the oh, Lion yes, King. Yes, that's right. Right. Yeah. I forget what's the bird's name. Um. Mm, oh, I don't remember. Zazu. Zazu. Thank you. That's, that's Zazu. Something that would have bothered me. I I Something couldn't have focused on the album, to be frank, if, if, if that wasn't resolved. Again, you're not Frank. You're Steve. Oh, jeez. Gotta remember this stuff. We need We're somebody. Professionals. We need somebody on this show named Frank. Just so we can make that joke and not me not correct it. Yeah. I'll get be... my name changed just so it stops coming up. Can we call you Shirley? Don't call me Shirley. Don't call me Shirley. Never. Okay. <laughs> so this week is... I hate everyone who doesn't get that reference. No, well, everyone gets that reference. Okay. It's one of the better comedies of all time. Of the... All time? Of the pre-2000s. So. For sure. At least. No, it just broke people out of the depressing 80s... Uh, excuse me, the depressing 70s movies. That's because I believe true. that was the early 80s. Yes, it was. The reference is Airplane. Yeah, we're, we're talking about Airplane. See, some people don't know. You don't know. It depends on how young or old our audience is. I don't know. Google Analytics tells us it's approximately between 25 and 35. Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, Still this, doesn't place them really firmly within the 70s to begin with, though. I mean, it, yeah, no, I, it's true. I'm very so, disappointed so, with uh, even yeah. people my age. Yeah. Then again, growing up, especially... Yeah, but you're also an old man, Steve. Especially through, like, 95... I'll talk to your elders that way. <laughs> the WB, what was the CW previously... Uh, played a lot of old school comedies on Saturday, approximately eleven to yeah, one o'clock in the batteries afternoon. Batteries not included. Short Circuit, oh, Airplane, classic, right there. See? So it would all have been... right, except that it's the CW, which was WB previously. I'm WPIX <laughs> actually. Back then it was WPIX. No, you're right. WPIX. That's right. And that was the. the that's like the actual call uh, yeah. for the um, for the that channel. stations went one one. Call. In a in a tangential discussion, what's up with 20th century that Fox? Wasn't tangential. Like, like, what is what? It's why a bigger are they still thing. 20th century still. Oh yeah, that's right. They should change. I mean, it's Futurama they're, they're has anything 21st to do with it. Well, they were they're not 30th century. No, no, no. See, that they were not allowed to do 20th century Fox, and Fox got really upset that they put down 30th century Fox for that show. No, it I was don't believe this. No, I don't believe it was, it was 20th contention. century Fox. It still is, isn't it? No, no, it was a point of contention in Futurama to put down 30th century Fox. Okay, that was so a big it's thing. St- but it still is 20th Century yes, Fox. Yes, they yes. just got the rights to just change the, no, no, the number. No, 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 they, they didn't get the they rights. They just did it. They just did, did it. to make yeah. fun of Fox. Oh, that's different. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, back on topic. Now, now that we've had a complete there was never sidetrack. never a topic. Um, yeah, most of these more uh, uh, early podcast moments are rants. Anyway. Yeah, mostly I'm trying to get caffeine out of my system, so I, I'm at... I'm, I'm trying to get it in my system. You John's few... pick is this week. Um, so why don't you... Tell the audience what you picked, if they didn't pay the attention to the notes last week. <laughs> well, I was listening to my favorite station at this time uh, at work, 107.1. It's uh, available in the Westchester area, and they play, they play a lot of like old-school, new-school music side-by-side. Side. So I'm getting you know the newest Modest Mouse I've reviewed very recently, alongside Blackbird from The Beatles. So it's really a great station for me. And they played a little song called Perfect Life. I find it really curious because it was a song on the radio that ended up being more of a story. I, I was I was listening to it. I was like, hey, what is this? So I did uh, everybody's favorite, Sound Hound. Started looking up lyrics, listening to it, playing around with it. And I found Stephen Wilson. And I was like, what is this? He was described as pop prog. And it was an unusual combination. After sampling the album, little tidbits here and there, I had to bring on what we're reviewing this week. Hand, period. Cannot, period. Erase, period. 
Yeah, and I, I was I was quite shocked that you picked this. I mean, granted, it sounds like you picked it on a bit of a whim, but it ties quite an interesting array of subjects together, from the, the genre, first of all, which you could generally just call prog. I mean, granted, there's some examples, and certainly that track might be more of an example of pop prog, but it's just prog. So let's go from the genre to the man, Stephen Wilson, to the album itself and its very unique subject. Starting off with uh, the genre, progressive rock. We've only had the opportunity to look at a handful of prog bands, actually just two here on the podcast. Among them, we had Godsticks uh, in Visits Conundrum back in episode 51, which is still our highest rated album to date. And uh, in relation to prog, it sort of stepped into its own ballpark by just maybe being a little bit more melodic and texturally experimental. And then we had Scale the Summits, The Migration back in episode 67, which leaned very metal at times, as many prog rock bands do, and also a little post-rock at times, owing to their use of very impressionistic guitars and such. But at the end of the day, prog rock is really not so much a sound as it is a form, as we've cited. It relies on experimentation with longer forms that essentially free us from expectation and predictability. So, while I like to note those exceptions and those two bands that I just mentioned, Stephen Wilson, by contrast, and a little by crossover, is widely considered to simply be prog incarnate. By most accounts, the poster child of the genre. And I'll preface this by saying that this is all subjective. I take a lot of it from my friend James. He's a big prod guy. But Stephen Wilson is certainly considered like a kind of prodigious figure, or progdigious, if you prefer. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, he's hailed as like a visionary, an innovator, mastermind, the little engine that could, all these ridiculous like sensational labels that you can find. And indeed, like all this pomp and sensation is kind of easy to fall for, especially from what you might gather by how many times he's been featured on the cover of Prog magazine. I'm actually always shocked when I enter Barnes & Noble. I see his face taking up the whole cover, and I'm like, wait, wasn't he on the last issue too? They just just can't get enough of him. So now that we're on the man himself, let's provide a little bit of background. Stephen Wilson was originally known as the frontman of the band Porcupine Tree, a little bit more metal-oriented prog band formed back in the UK in 1987. Started as a solo project, but then grew into more of a band atmosphere, but Stephen Wilson was always the mastermind. Now, he only officially went solo solo in 2010, and that gave him the chance to do different things. Some of the prod community might believe that it released him from his binds, from the binds of Porcupine Tree, so that he could step out and go full art, while others thought that his work edged a little more on the pretentious side. I'll reference the videos in which he released uh, with the accompanying film for his first solo album, Insurgentes, where he systematically destroys iPods and as, as sort of like a protest to Apple, who limits their users, you know, to, to inferior quality MP3s. Meanwhile, he simultaneously releases a digital copy of Pure Flack Files, which completely excludes the Apple crowd. So now, while I agree that MP3s are kind of dumbing down our ears a bit, I do respect the jab at Apple. But the destruction of the iPods and the statement as a whole just kind of went a little bit far. That's, that's, that's your classic, you know, the, the pretentious statement that a lot of artists have. But still, that's the character you're dealing with. He's very, he's very strong-willed. He says what he, what he thinks. You've got to appreciate that in any artist. But back to the music, I, that's really what counts in the end. And the music has always been pretty damn good, even if words like great, stellar, or otherworldly are reserved terms, or at least highly debatable terms. Best put, he's a solid bet for a generalized prog fan. Now to the album and its subject matter, which is a whole different thing entirely. Hand cannot erase, as John told us. A quick Google search of this album will reveal a concept behind it. It's not anything that we have to dig through. A lot of times, you know, we go through albums and we have to pick apart and kind of give it our own theme, because not all albums just come with a packaged theme sold right there in the book jacket. A lot of things are a little bit more subjective. But in this case, it, it's all pretty apparent. Um, back in 2003, there was a case in England that became something of folklore because of how bizarre and of how sad it is. A woman named Joyce Carol Vincent, fairly young, I think, early 30s or maybe late 30s, uh, was found dead in her apartment after three years with the TV running, with presents wrapped, and no one had inquired about her whereabouts for three full years. The only reason they even found her at the time is because in the UK, they have these programs where if you're in need of financial assistance, the rent is essentially paid in half with automatic deposits to the landlord, to utilities, things like that. So everything just ran as usual while she sadly lay there decomposing. Now, this story received a lot of media attention because it became kind of the pillar example of isolation. 
and what it means to distance yourself from the world, as she had. The woman was young, attractive, well-educated, but somewhere along the line, she drifted. She took some jobs to get by, and when they didn't work out, she moved, hopped from one place to the other, didn't keep a lot of friends. So you can see why this would resonate with anyone who even just shares a piece of her story, because it spells pretty much the most dreaded outcome, the exemplification of dying alone, which is a sad thing for anyone, and I, my heart goes out to it. It was very, a very uh, revealing story for me at the time. I had read about this maybe a year ago, and I was very moved by it. And then a few months ago, out of the blue, my friend James, same guy from earlier, big prod guy, he mentions the story to me, and I asked how he found out, and he said it was owed to the release of this album, which pretty much was inspired by the whole tale. And then John here says he's going to pick a Stephen Wilson album, and that shocked me by itself, and sure enough, it turns out to be this Stephen Wilson album. So it's quite an interesting connection, and it's a very, very interesting uh, subject going in. We don't, we don't normally have uh, the theme handed to us on a silver platter. Yeah, I mean, anyone with a quick Google search can find it, so it's not like we're going to be attacking something that's hard to figure out. Nah. And yet I went into this blind, and... I saw glimpses of this same theme, maybe not the full piece until we had really started discussing it, but it's still present there without any background information. There's hints at isolationism, there's hints at uh, a female character, even when it's being portrayed by a masculine voice. So it's not like you need to do research. No. It's, I mean, it's... It's. It might help, I think, just because, first of all, because I think it's a story that everyone should hear. It's one of those human interest stories that I think will probably make a lot of people feel for the person and maybe even think about their own life in comparison. I mean, it's very easy to kind of, like, drift from, from group to group, especially if you don't feel like like you're anchored in some sense. It's um, But you never want it to end that way. I mean, that sort of brings to mind why we eventually sort of settle in the end is because we become familiarized with our surroundings and then it kind of keeps us from having to deal with that scenario when as we grow older we get families and there's always usually someone to check on our whereabouts like especially in the cell phone age in the digital age you know with social media today it probably would never happen but you know this was 2003 and it really hadn't settled in yet so social media wasn't everywhere smartphones weren't everywhere in 2003 so it's a lot easier for something like this to happen then exactly um, everyone's way more connected now, but you know that said, it's still kind of scary that idea of dying alone or being alone. And but also on the other hand, humans fear change by nature. It's an instinct. It's a reflex to yeah. to, to, to remind yourself, well, is this right? You know, this is a big change. I'm afraid because is is it right? I should analyze it. Oh, it's the right thing. Well, let's push through. But it's a natural reaction, the fight or flight. Exactly. And a lot, I mean, one of the main things that spurs that is regret. And yeah. sure enough, we have that, like, right from the beginning of the album. A lot of these album, uh, these track titles will start to, like, give hints at the, the event. But, of course, as, as an artist, it, it's in his power to, you know, be a little bit more tasteful in the execution. And the story that is portrayed here is not an exact replica of, of what actually happened. Instead, this is more of an extrapolation. He created his own tale. The album is supposed to be from the female perspective. Um, that shines through, through in several places. And, and from there, he kind of starts, I don't know, filling in the gaps because, frankly, no one knows exactly what happened with her. It was yeah. really more unearthed, you know, what in, little information they had. Yeah. It's unfortunate that no one can even talk to her. It's like a kind of post-therapy. Yeah. Um, the first track is First Regret. We start with the first. This track starts off very contemplative. It's a synthy kind of piano intro. Um, This is an instrumental track that I like. But yet, I also found it interesting in the fact that it's it's it really wasn't that depressing for a track that started off as first regret. This actually had a lot of hope here, which which enlightens you know what he's really trying to do with this character is present them through the whole arc of her being. You know, the optimism from the get go. I heard a lot of this through the piano. There's also the background, almost children playing, the yeah, little sign that, bit. That ended... Uh, the that whole arc added, of her life, if anything. <laughs> well, that they, specifically added a very ominous undertone for me. Because it's not the sort of thing without the picture to go along with it, with the very distant background kind of a work, without anything concrete and smiling to bring it forward with. It's It, it ended up being very hollow, and that... When you think of children laughing and equating it to hollow, that's not a very pleasant combination. 
Um, that's true, and actually, that, that's that shows a little bit of insight that you even stepped far. Again, that it, it, it separates the where we were both at when we listened to this album. I mean, I knew about the story going in, so for me, it was more of a just straight-on-the-nose thing. You yeah. hear the children playing in the background, and I see exactly what he's doing. It's sort of like foreshadowing through something that seems very positive, seemed very positive to me, all right, the innocence of youth, but because I know what's coming, then, you know, that's sort of the, the, the reaction it left on me. And yet John here didn't know that, and he still picked up on that foreshadowing. Well, it's also foreshadowing because... Um, it's not just her life, but the idea of if you live in a city and it's silent where you are, you yeah. all you would hear through the window is children play, or that something, kind of, of that or effect. something of that effect. So I mean, it, that's kind of the the scene. I, it picked it built a setting too very right. easily, and it gave a very airy, a very space kind of an introduction to this album almost immediately. Just having the different levels of volume working with the pieces and the mild distortion throughout it. It, it did a good job of, of creating a setting but insulating the individual in that setting. I could see that, but at the same time, there's also more of a generality to this. I mean, granted, I see the whole urban setting that you described. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, first of all, I believe that's true for both, um, for both the real event and the character that's being portrayed here. But at the same time, that, that piano style, it, it, it seems to be like it's this very light... I actually kind of compared it to... Uh, Julia Newman, who's a composer for a lot of primetime drama work, um, one among them being Bones, you know, and this very, like, light sort of piano style that you'll find in a lot of primetime dramas, frankly. It seems to be just the sort of the way to go for primetime drama composition when they hire out composers who sort of fit this niche, and it's fairly non-confrontational. It puts you in a nice uh, static place, and it's kind of like the the music that would exist in the background over like the all the little quirky things that the characters might say or do. Um, very, just you can almost gloss over it. It's peaceful, but you know, I I feel like I have that reference point, so it's a, it's a little bit blasé. Well, I won't go as far as saying blasé, but I did find the piece as a whole to be very much iconic introduction for the album, an iconic idea of. Here is something, and the setting, the the design of the music itself did did strike me as a little bit cliche. But I I'm not saying that as no, an no, no. Cliche isn't really isn't isn't the word I would use for this. It's really more just that it it coincidentally fits something that I I associate with being non-confrontational. Hence, almost like a kind of reserved hope, the hope that everyone has as they just go about their lives. Not anything you'd like, you know, put your put your money on or anything and and sure it achieved in that a whole opening track as long as it is which is very short two minutes one second and it is very hopeful it thickens out a little bit with the chime work you know there's that that little light warbling in the background but then maybe toward the end here it starts changing up a little bit with that thump that starts building up toward the end of the track that's actually where i got a little bit more foreshadowing here everything becomes just a slight bit more doubtful. Like, the electronica starts breaking up at the tail end and, and sort of breaking up the order of this intro. That connects very well to our second track, Three Years Older. Um, I was a little thrown off, at least in the beginning, because it kind of had this cheesy synth and guitar work, stuff that we've kind of heard before in other places, um, that, that at first bummed me out a little bit just because the, the intro track was going in such an interesting st- direction to follow it up immediately with something that I've kind of heard before kind of threw me. But it grows into something more. Well, even the thing before that, for instance, like the very beginning, you get those, the, that string sound that yeah. feels almost like a little bit fake. Like it, it, it clearly is. It seems like it's a synth strings, you know, the same thing you'd find just about on any keyboard. Um, but, you know, a little more playing around with dissonance. I appreciated that. But then right from that, it seemed like a harsh break into the thing you just mentioned, this sort of guitar and rock-heavy riff, which was very classic rock at this point. It, it feels very much like The Who, and The Who also is like almost... It carries the same positivity, frankly, as, as like, I would gather from a lot of that primetime drama music. So I'm still, I still feel a connection... Well, you used The Who in CSI Miami, if I recall correctly. Actually, yeah. I Actually, thought all the CSIs. Oh, yeah, they all had a different Who song. Yeah. That- <laughs> who Are You? Um, um, not Bob won't, O'Reilly. Um, won't Get Fooled Again. Won't Get Fooled Again. That I've that- never watched the New York once, I don't know. Yeah. That may have been a subconscious observation on my part, but, um, <laughs> but that's well, interesting. Well, this guitar that comes in, I do find it to be a lot of fun, to be very... Playful. I'm I'm liking the 
It's not bra- it's groundbreaking, but it's fun. Sure. It's yeah. fun. It's playful. It's the fingering is not the best in the world, but it's definitely better well, rather than... The, rather the riff is not the best in the world. The riff is just that classic, you know, that classic rock riff that you could play as, as any form of, like, intro for your rock concept track or whatever. But then things start changing a little bit. Like, the bass steps in. A lot, lot thicker here. Starts to sound a lot more prog-oriented. Things get a little bit more complex. And then the guitar steps in with this melodic line that kind of, again, recaptures the hope of the intro. But then everything breaks for a second as, as the guitar plays its little interlude. And then suddenly we do such a prog thing here. We go back with the bass, stronger than ever, with a full-on solo, which did not last terribly long, maybe 10 seconds. Again, prog as a form, you have to accept that a lot of these sectional changes are going to be fairly brief. By uh, proponents of the genre, it keeps you interested and it keeps you feeling as if there's this 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 grand story being told you know it all it has all the classic components of an overture here um really the intro was was almost just passive this is really more of the overture it's really setting you up in a sense um especially i need to comment on that bass as well that that st- started sounding as we're throwing around prog references here it sounded a lot like the playing of getty lee uh main bass player and front man of Rush. Yes. Um, and it also, I think, blended really with the guitar. What seemed kind of cheesy and shallow at first, when blending with the bass and the percussion, really kind of filled out and, and gave a more beautiful tone to the whole song. Yeah. And this is this to and fro that exists for a while. We go back into uh, the sort of dual guitar and piano work, and then it dives back into a guitar solo now. So see, we have to give everything its share here. A very extended intro. But then suddenly, there's a much more defined break. Um, even though it just seemed like it could have been dropped anywhere in this in this mix, in this interplay between instrument and instrument. But I think this is truly where the tracks and, and the album seems to really find itself. This very soft transition, and then all of a sudden, the guitars have much longer tones, these, these drones almost, and then the vocals begin, which I found very, very reminiscent of Pink Floyd, uh, especially actually in the second phrase when it starts becoming uh, dupl- duplicated vocals. Uh, they're both they're both pl- in tandem. They're both harmonizing. That that's such a Pink Floyd. Even just the tone at which he sings and uh, the other member, or perhaps it's himself harmonizing over himself. Could be doubling. Either either or, but it's um. But I thought that was absolutely beautiful. And this is where I think the track just stepped out and captured, I think, the soul of the character here. Well, for sure, he sounds... It it does have a Pink Floyd sound here. His vocals and his style kind of go all over the place. But definitely in this song, it's rooted in that kind of sound. Sure, and I'm not even saying... You know, didn't just I throw around the reference is not not a... Is not a, a... pointless callback it's really more that like pink floyd i always loved them for their atmosphere and i always found that they as a group were capable of so many things and capturing so many so many moments and here stephen wilson was simply able to do the same thing it's not so much that they sound the same as that he has captured the same talent and all this is also leading to the fact that the story that unfolds here is very reminiscent of classic rock as well seems that he's drawing a lot of elements from the late 60s through the late 70s as inspiration for what he's doing in this song. Um, Just the way it starts, you cross the schoolyard with your head held down and walk the streets under the breaking cloud with a hundred futures cascading out. It's complicated. It's complicated. Even this form that he's working with, even the the pacing and the storytelling he's doing is very reminiscent of a lot of my favorite storytellers from that era, like Crosby, Stills, Nash, and and individuals like that. It's, It's a lot of old school styles being used in this piece. And that foreshadowing we're talking about, the the children playing in a schoolyard, is directly referenced in the song to follow. The the first line. So there's that connection there too, very obviously in the lyrics, which is nice to see. And I also uh, had to sort of bring to mind the the, the title, you know, three years older. I, I have to kind of like that that number keeps ringing in my head because of the amount of time it took for them to find, you know, the real the real person that um, the story's based on yeah so i i find it interesting that she says that he says three years older um now of course this may very well just be again another example of foreshadowing but it seems more this is like a coming of age tale at this moment and yet it's still interesting that he th- shows the same exact amount of time three years you know unfound and yet at the same time this is more of that like three years more developed in life it's it's sort of a weird duality. Almost seems like it's 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 the optimism and the pessimism at the same time, or rather the wry the wry pessimism existing somewhere in the background. Um, 
it's 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 an interesting reference. I'll I'll just leave that at at that for now. Um, let's go back to the music, and then I think I'm going to uh, sort of bounce back to the lyrics. First of all, we get a lot of different things in this track. It is true. Uh, after the interplay between the verse and the choruses, and I really do love the choruses here. They almost have the same exact character as the verses themselves. That simple, I can feel you more than you really know. And I love the way he holds out that line. It's very delicate. I will love you more than I'll ever show. You know, again, this kind of like tender and compassion to contrast with what we now know about the, about the event. Um, and then all of a sudden, we start to get some pretty harsh shifts. Granted, of course, it should be mentioned, this is an extremely long track, so you sit with these sections for an extended period of time. Um, the first major shift I felt after this sort of, like, soft, delicate section is this more grand uh, re reprise of the, earlier, of the earlier section, when you get the big, you know, guitar and bass riff steps back in with a lot more confidence, back to that kind of who feel, and then suddenly we recede as prog true to form we recede backward and we're in a different place all of a sudden all of a sudden now this jazz influence just steps in out of nowhere granted we have the same tone as the piano from the intro but the technique is so much more jazzy i mean it's it's like a light jazz though a, a more like a restaurant jazz maybe safe within the jazz community but it's powerful in its way and frankly i could listen to this stuff for a, a, quite a length of time it's, it's sophisticated in its way it definitely was a, um, not startling is the wrong word, but it was definitely a unique change yeah. that I didn't see coming. And that, I like that. You know, there are so many songs that we listen to, especially lately on the podcast, where we say, oh, well, it's going to go there. Oh, there it went. I mean, like, John was doing that last week. I know. It's predicting some stuff. And so it's nice to have that in a song where we can't really see where it's going, and it's still a little bit full of surprises. And for a 10-minute song, because it's 10 minutes, 20 seconds long, it's great that it has these phases because it keeps the song itself from stagnating, from really becoming overblown one way or the other. The different elements and the builds that he has for these different styles that he's infusing in this song all have a commonality to them. They remain within the same realm. You still think that they're part of the same melody or harmony or what have you, the story doesn't lose the cohesion, but because it keeps reinventing itself, the piece maintains its form as it goes through 10 minutes of, of sound. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're still in the beginning now. Because, you know, Matt, you were just mentioning how we've had a lot of examples recently where, you know, <laughs> a, a track we could predict the changes, but also we've had the reverse. We've had a lot of instances, in, you know, we're deeper in the album suddenly bands just decide to like all right clean break here brand new thing but that's more of a problem and then we start throwing around words like jarring and such but it's more of a problem deeper in an album especially when we start like questioning the style of the artist but i've always said uh or even more recently that the beginning of an album is so important because it sets the stage for what you might do so we accept all these changes very readily because it's in our first track Essentially, second we're getting track, uh, yeah tech, second track technically, but we get we get the grandeur of of the the quintessential overture, which would indeed include all these different sections. So we just take it in stride, and which is why I was so impressed by this because it's essentially one awesome thing followed by the next. Uh, we're not even in the third leg of this track yet. Yeah, and also it was one of those things where it doesn't feel its length, which is very important when you have a track that's ten minutes long. The fact that even when you're half only halfway through it you don't you don't feel like it's taking it's it's taking forever yeah and i'm a fan of long music it's of, of longer tracks it's just you know it takes it takes a right artist in, in order to pull that off with with finesse well one of the things that he does is he uses pacing and pausing in his music he uses crescendos to actually punctuate some of these ideas and then he might draw it back to a soft guitar or a soft piano or something like that to begin a new rebuild, to introduce a new element or a new style into the song itself. This use almost segregates parts of the track. You can still get the basic theme work, and that's what I'm saying. There's a through line here. But because of that, that use of really bringing it up to a high point and then cutting it there, gives a pseudo-finality within the song itself. True. But let's, let's, let's move right to, the, to the, probably the biggest change in this track yet. I, I would probably call this like the proggiest move that they have because this is, you know, the nature of prog is that some critics would, would say that they're a little bit too jumpy, but I still love this just as much. Just as I'm describing, I thought this was a great, great step. We break from that, that you know, return to the chorus, which had more of the, you know, 
uh the piano based guitar duality it was all yeah, the come down here was very was very delicate from from the the course following that sort of jazz section and then all of a sudden we go into this this shebang like for anyone that knows the band, yes, this is exactly the kind of jam that they would essentially have. The Hammond organ steps in, at least I believe that was what it was. Unmistakable organ sound makes an appearance here, and it's just so funky. That call back to the 70s that we may have even had it a little bit earlier, even just in, in the sense of The Who and other areas, but this is a distinctly different genre around the same exact time. Uh, and it's the kind of track that would have been written then, the kind of like long, rambly yes track that goes into its own series of uh, event after event and theme after theme, and it just takes its chance here to, to go off. There are times when it's very funky, and there are also times when it recedes and, and sort of steps very, very dark and, and chaotic. Almost, uh, Matt, you you used the word frenetic, although it might not have been in this instance. It was at a later point. It I, was. I feel I feel the the word just stepping through here in I've, every sense. Just the use of the tritone and everything. It's it's off putting, and and irresistible at the same time. And yet, it doesn't even stay funky. Even though the, those main elements stay together, it seems to even shift within the genre itself, within the instruments themselves, uh, to, to leave that little bit of funk and go a little more jazz, to actually shy away from what you describe as the yes section, and actually to go a little bit more, uh, go a little bit earlier than yes, to actually go almost full jazz in, in uh, several of the elements. At points, it well, felt the like jazz the or- is more of a modern jazz. So I wouldn't say earlier than yes per se. It's more of a modern, like again, that light restaurant jazz thing. Well, it's just it keeps. I mean, the organ was almost shredding. I don't, I don't use that oh, word lightly. Absolutely, but it's an organ and it's shredding. Like those two things don't normally go together. Yeah, no, that's true. You actually brought to mind it. It almost is more like a jazz fusion. I think that's really yeah. more what it yeah. is. Like and- stepping from the more traditional, or well, traditional or rather modern restaurant jazz into this really, really heavy like jazz fusion prog sound. It was, it was, it was a blast. I, I, I got to be honest. The song was definitely entertaining, and then. I really like how also after all of this and these changes and these movements, the, the tail end of this track still gives us more foreshadowing. It brings us to a place where we know we're still going to get more along this dark story that's yet to take place. Yeah. Was this was this where you used Frenetic? Because this is where I was using I used Furious. Frenetic. I, I no, used, he used it much later, actually. I used oh, okay. it much later in the album. but The it, word stuck. <laughs> it did. And it can describe a lot on this record, actually. But this movement in particular hints at the darkness with these deep tones and these deeper sound that they conclude the track with really kind of pull you to a even sharper foreshadowing point. And it was the the depth there that just seemed so angry. And that's why I want to use the word furious. Even though those tones weren't the speed of what you would think furious. They weren't that, that sort of thing. But the level that they hit was just, especially in contrast with some of the stuff that had already gone on earlier, was just dangerously angry at times. And it was beautiful. Sure, and we have a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a come down at this point again. I mean, it starts sort of recapturing the tone of the beginning with that more delicate guitar solo, and then there's a reprise that that links the the positive tones with the chaotic instrumentation. So it was a really nice wrap up. Um, let's take that opportunity, al- although some of these lyrics will, will probably have to wait until um, in, in, until revisiting them in a later point. But let's go to. Track three, Hand Cannot Erase. This is important because it's the title track. And though I did like the tone in the beginning, I thought that the guitars here, you know, they were capturing more of like an alt rock sound. Um, Barely. It was more of a pop rock sound even. That's the thing. It started to kind of like, I. it was a strange shift. Like, I saw it and I wanted to believe in it after after just like a few seconds and then once it took into this like this pop sound and you take into other uh, other things like the rudimentary drum box in the background very like basic stuff a more like almost demo-esque drum pattern yeah. um and then these just steady riffs lo-fi vocals i was just like this is a strange recession for what is basically the title track and should by all rights be the meat there was there's a great message in this song. There really is. And it's a message that I think is drowned out by the mediocrity around it. It's also when I realize, and this is this is something... That's what I was going to get to, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's something in Wilson's voice that is, I hate to say it, but perfectly suited for mainstream pop. Well, the thing is well, about it's... his voice is that he's singing like every other 
90s pop rock singer was singing. Not too high. The inflections are all there to be a lot of rising. Got a little bit of gravel in there. You know, kind of almost like we just, uh, you know, we did Ben Gibbard not that long ago, and his his we almost described his him, his vocals it's not like having terrible heights we still see the talent within but it's in it's it's confined to a more limited range yeah. and we we see examples of that here it's still very smooth very sweet perfect quality you know, that 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 irresistible twang but, but the there's the problem is with the with that vocal style with this music it rings of songs I've heard dozens of times yeah. by bands I could list endlessly. Like That's... Soul Asylum is the one that comes to mind for me. It's just like you listen to Runaway Train and that even singing, very kind of mellow, chill out, man. Lullaby. I kind grant. Of setting, I grant yeah. it's true. It's very. It's really safer than even most of really? uh, Wilson's vocals in this album, and he does really step out in certain places. There's still a, a, a happy medium, but this is. This is very safe for him, and that's why this ended up being one of my least favorite tracks on the album this early on, because not just because of what it had to follow, and that's that's pretty a pretty big part of it, but also again I can't get back that that title like it it sh- this should have been we had all the elements of the overture yeah. as I've said multiple times now. Well, now you step in to content, and we start off so delicately so cutesy and it, it's really more the music that bothers bothers me more than the vocals frankly it's that yeah. steady eighth note work over and over and over and that just it, it makes this very boring and we have some of some of the most intriguing ideas i've heard in music because so many times you hear be strong be yourself be great be who you are oh, you mean lyrically lyrically yeah um there, there's so many different ideas of how to be a stronger person when speaking. A lot of artists like to do that, to speak to their audience and try to promote happiness and well-being. But here it's a little bit different. I especially like the line, And a love like this makes us strong. We laugh it off if things go wrong. It's not you. Forgive me if I find I need more space. Because trust means we don't have to be together every day. And right there, that's a message that we don't normally hear. That idea of, yeah, we can love one another, but we can also be separate and still love one another. We can be our own people, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a change on the normal idea of what we get, and it's great. It's a very healthy way to capture the idea that, well, like, an argument isn't the end of everything. You know, the yeah. people are different. They're, it's just natural that you will come to, come to blows every once in a while. So, you know, it's, it, it feels like this is something... This is a very unifying kind of track. Again, still much on the same uh, the same element of hope from earlier. All of this is just very, very positive. Even even just starting as 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 with the earlier uh, verse. Together we have this love. Even so, it's not enough. Bruised and burned, we won't lose heart. And just because life gets hard, writing, lying, emails to our friends back home, feeling guilty if we sometimes want to be alone, and then that chorus, hand cannot erase this love. And I really do like that. I mean, the title is is is, is sweet in its own sense, and the way he, he, he presents this um, kind of brings in elements that were not present in the original case. The idea that, well, technology is sort of important in sort of keeping us together today, and, and that, well, unfortunately wasn't as true, even as recent as 2003. But the lyrics, unfortunately, aren't enough. I mean, the way he delivers them, combined with the music, even though it fills out a bit in the choruses, it's just not enough. I lose sight of this I agree. sweetness. The, the lyrics here are capturing something that I think the, the, the music is, is perhaps failing at. Now, I did have an idea over the course of this track that it, it should be noted. This album is in, is in the, the character of, of, of... It's written in a female character from the get-go. So... You you sort of like have to see it in those terms. Um, it's not like that should be groundbreaking in any sense. The only the only thing here that is just a little bit abstract is well, it's very very clear that a, a, a man is writing in the character of a female. But something about this just almost strikes me as being like so like he purposely pursued a more stereotypical like femme pop sound. That is to say, like a brand of pop that's aimed and marketed at at younger women. It seems to be that, but like whether that's coming from you know statistical evidence of like you know the that demographic you know young female tastes, or rather it's an extrapolation of of what's just marketed to them, or an unfair or like an unfair characterization of what you know 
of what women actually like. I can't say whether it's any of that. I just feel like it is fitting that that form, you know, that classic, like, stereotypical sitcom or primetime drama form where it's like, all right, grab a tub of ice cream and cry out your sorrows, you know, in the background. I just found it all a little bit, a little bit campy in its way. It's just, I feel like if he, if he had to take that illusion and that jump to make it sound like that, to make it fit, I feel like it's almost, you know, I don't want to throw around the word sexism easily, but it's feel like it is a nah, little. Yeah, I see. I don't. I don't. I don't want to like. I don't want to 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 say that. It's really more just like a an unfair characterization or just a an oddball characterization. It just seems if really anything, odd. If, if anything, the the biggest combination of things I see going on here, it's like he's trying to rewrite the middle by Jimmy Eat World. Between a, a lot of the inflection uses he has going on there, the punctuation he uses, instead of guitar, it's more of a bell-oriented, maybe piano work going on to accent certain syllables. The the ever-present, I have to strum chord work of the guitar. See, that, and the I, message itself of the middle. It's like he's rewriting it. I just, I like the message, but it's it's written... Not as well. This is why, like, the concept itself feels like it's just capturing that environment. And that environment always felt a little bit campy to me. Um, because there's always, like, these reductions of what, you know, certain demographics like. And frankly, I don't, I think it's less really like that femme pop style as much as it is the, you know, trying to make it in the city kind of vibe. It's that. And that always came across a little bit campy, too. You know, the. Oh, what was that sitcom back in Mary the 70s? Tyler Moore Mary show. Tyler Moore Show. I mean, granted, that's like, okay, it's still got its moments. It's a great show for its time. But like, you know, do you need to revisit that constantly? I feel like that's, that's the attempt here. I'm not making any insinuations, but it's like that's how it comes across. And it seems like a weak approach to all the different things that he stated in, in the opening, or rather the second track. Right. But that said about this track, we do go from this song to the first single of the record, and one of my favorites on the record, honestly. Um, This is the song that John said he heard on the radio that inspired him to pursue the record. It's called Perfect Life. Um, If you haven't seen the music video, please go watch it. It's beautiful as well. But this song is, it's a story. Completely, it's a story within a song structure. Um, It's, uh, the vocals are actually not by Stephen Wilson. They're by Catherine Begley. She's the one who recites the story in the verses. Um, and I just feel like it gives a very stunningly powerful message from, from start to finish. This song, it, even the first part, the first half of which we get this story, isn't even a song itself. It's more of an art piece in this case. Well, it, it helps it, the it, fact that it's spoken word. For exactly. We don't really get vocal like um outright singing here it's just the simple spoken word by Catherine jenkins it's right and you know in the background very simple construct simple like drum work uh just simple drum box caliber instrument in the background that's pretty much it and then maybe two chord changes using the synth um yeah just a, a little bit of space in the percussion and in a couple of the random noises just to keep things airy and from intruding upon the story itself longer drones again yeah so. This is is more just in the background. They, they all all that's going on is just a little exploration of of the texture of the song itself, because I found myself and I think I can speak for Matt at least hanging on every word that was being said here. Absolutely, just from the opening lines, and I think they were just masterfully designed this way. When I was thirteen, I had a sister for six months. I mean, right there, that is going to be a story. Well, because that you is hear that, you're like, well, story. how is that possible? Was she a six-month-old that didn't make it? Was she visiting for six months? Like, your brain can go anywhere with that. And see, I but see, I read it, and uh, my brain didn't go anywhere. It went to the one place it, it, it well, could. Sure. And that's, of course, I mean, well, uh, even that is a little bit debatable, but I think, I think it, it's more apparent as you read. She arrived one February morning, pale and shell-shocked. From past lives, I could not imagine. She was three years older than me, again going back to that, but that's a different usage. But in no time, we became friends. We'd listen to her mixtapes, Dead Can Dance, Felt, This Mortal Coil. She introduced me to her favorite books, gave me clothes, and my first cigarette. Sometimes we would head down to Blackbird's Moor and watch the barges on Grand Union in the twilight. She said, the water has no memory. For a few months, everything about our lives was perfect. It was only us. We were inseparable. 
but gradually she passed into another distant part of my memory until I could no longer remember her face, her voice, even her name. Now before I recite the final refrain, which is actually quite the important <coughs> contrast to this, obviously this is the tale of that that temporary friendship. You know, yeah. that person who was really, really important for you. No. Nope. Really... Nope. This is her reflecting upon her three years ago. This is her reflecting upon her own life from three years ago. That's no, what I don't get that. No, at I don't all. see that at all. Yeah, that's that's I don't... that's an abstract way to approach this that I think is just again th this album is a little bit more on point than I think you'd, you'd give it credit for. Value, yeah. Again, based no, on the, based think... on the story I uh, or, or rather the real like... life event that that happened, I think this is this is that temporary uh, acquaintance you had, but the just... temporary relationship that could have perhaps turned into something lifelong. The thing that probably could have pulled out pulled her out of the of the events to come but unfortunately due to the character in question here and due to the nature of her being it it was it was doomed to be a, a passing thing it just it sounds like the story of someone who had someone come into their life and quickly go because see you're saying that the character is the person telling the story i think the character is the person who came and went and the person telling the story is one of is the main a friend a former friend of the main character who's no longer with us? That's a harder one to really prove. I think here in the yeah. lyrics, I think that might just all be your interpretation. I take this all as as the first person story. Um, all that said, though, about this, from these verses that are spoken word, we go into a beautifully sung chorus by Stephen Wilson that really kind of very much pulls together the whole song. Can you read that lyric for me, Steve? The the chorus that comes after the verse. We have got we have got the perfect life. And it's, that's it. And it's just the way he delivers it. It's so matter of fact, it really just hits home. Now, it should really be mentioned here that this is where the music, you know, steps out. Granted, mm -hmm. we had that very thin construct for the duration of, of all these verses. Um, but then, you know, the chorus steps in here with Stephen Wilson's voice, by contrast. And it's just, we've got the perfect life. And that, that remains, that the the... the, the the music here remains like this to the very, very end, and it just sort of builds and builds and builds on more four chords that are a little bit pop, but still, it's so worth it, you know, just for just for the the delicacy and his delivery within this. Is that the chords here are just A minor, D major, G major, C major. It's this very this very sort of rounded warmth. At the same time, you know, he's singing, "We've got the perfect life," and then there's these little slides in in the midst that really really promote it. You feel as if it was so so important as of that moment just those little slides between where he goes sort of ah you know sliding up um right between those phrases we've got the perfect life and he just repeats that and it sort of builds and builds and builds to the very end with the piano accents on each and every one of those chord changes but i mean I, you know the more and more i look at this i think there actually is some credit to your uh to your interpretation because and, and this is to say your interpretation matt <laughs> right. but that's because i i did think like when i first started this album, like, well, that's strange, right? First person from the story in which we know from a woman to be deceased. Like, well, that's strange, considering the whole thing should be told in retrospect. You can't ter very well tell an autobiography posthumously, can you? No. So it would make sense if other characters stepped in here to sort of say, ah, we knew her once. Yeah. Or at least, at least that, that really rings true in this, in this track here. Now that I see it in that sense, I think, I think that's that's even more powerful because that sort of promotes the character to say that well if if it's not that she could have fixed it it's perhaps that the other person could have fixed it you know like there's regret here on the other side of the coin for not purposely keeping you know that that girl anchored i think also this song as a structure and a complete piece really functions very well i really like it as this spoken art we've talked a lot about art on the podcast and art versus music I think this functions very strongly as an art piece and as a piece of music, and I enjoy it for both. Well, and that doesn't happen commonly, at least for me, when something is so clearly trying to be a piece of art. Well, the, the, uh, the I don't know, maybe it's an outro, it's like two minutes long of we got, excuse me, we have got, we have got the perfect light. That's there, and yeah, he sings it beautifully, but it's really there just so that he can reach his crescendo. Yeah. Just so that he can build and build and build with and the slide. Build. The slide is really just dead. just that, keep that going and going and going. And that I just I love it because he really just decides to go for it here. It's it's pure 
Legos. He's he's going from one or two pieces to the full castle that he sees before him in this music. It just keeps perpetuating. I enjoy just having a two minute outro of a repetition of just just trying to do some art here and see it all it all really depends on your point of view i barely even see it as outro more than just the chorus itself it's a it's a chorus that rings out to the end a chorus that it 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 maintains its plateau it keeps it and that it sums up the song as a whole in in the greatest irony and i I think that's even something we we kind of left out here that i was saying i was going to build to the the weird irony with that you know we've got the perfect life is that well you don't (laughs) or rather if you just see if you're just focused on the the confines of time life is short anyway so why not focus on how great six months were yeah sure i mean there's that too and it's often Reflection is definitely a part of this record as well, which is clearly oh, presented yeah. in this song. Well, yeah, reflection <laughs> thrown in there with regrets. And now we have another R, Routine. Track five. This one starts with the vocal piano pair. It's not the first time on this record that that... Well, it is the first time. It won't be the last time, rather. Um, this is... this. What I like about the beginning of this song is from that start with vocals and silence, not very far into the track, he utilizes silence also and John pointed out that there's this kind of wind sound effect that he uses in that silence to kind of move the song along to the next place where he wants it to go he he slowly introduces things like strings but when he wants to make a statement when he really wants to put a period on one of his sections especially in routine he lets everything drop off not just everything but the vocalist or everything but the percussion, but he lets everything drop off and you get a beat or two of silence, of a break, and it's almost next song, but because of what comes in next, it's once again one of those cases where he's doing dramatic differences section by section, but there's a unifying theme or a unifying melody or just a unifying little bit of him in this music that's keeping it together. Well, let's take this... um... Let's take this on the first section here because this is this is where he sort of presents I think the more defined meat I think of the well actually the, the previous track was really a good setup but this this I think continues that meat here the routine I feel like I'm a lot more in the present here or at least the issues are starting to stack up it's less of the delusion now but but the the reality um we start out with kind of a basic piano pop sound, but the chords here rely on a more like chromatic shift up, and they're kind of almost unsettling. They shift up, they shift back down chromatically. It's very close, very tight. Um, great melody just to boot here. I love the opening verse. What do I do with all the children's clothes? Such tiny things that still smell of them, and the footprints in the hallway onto my knees scrub them away. And then it starts to feel even stranger as we go into... The chorus, after we have a second verse, and then finally, Routine Keeps Me in Line. Now, this is sung by the female, not Stephen Wilson. Female steps in here, uh, the name escapes me at the moment. But Routine Keeps Me in Line helps me pass the time, concentrate my mind, helps me to sleep. And here, there's like, uh, everything just starts to feel so much stranger to me. And I know it's a vague term for how for how this develops, but... You know, even in the verse, it was strange, and this kind of like pushed it further. Uh, not just for the fact that we were kind of we just traded vocalists sort of out of nowhere here, but the music feels more clenched too. And even her stifled manner of speaking, which is reflected also in another instrument, the bass, just steps forward to make these short little pulses, barely not a bass line, but just you know stepping with a dit. And then another dit, <laughs> and it's just it's it's very off-putting. It's something I can't right quite put my finger on with this chorus. The bass also gets contrasted with uh, the very high end of the register of the piano, and that I don't know how to describe it other than unusual, unusual percussion. Yeah. Because the percussion, the the drums themselves don't follow like a form or anything going on here, in so much as it might be a drum line for something else. It's it's almost. A cracked mind. That's yeah. and especially when you start talking about what the lyrics themselves are saying. If you, that that chorus routine keeps me in line, the way she's saying it, very breathy, a little bit harder to understand. When you start adding these factors together, there's a crack in this mind going on right here. That you, it, it the turn with the, going from a male to a female vocalist to actually go back to that male vocalist right afterwards. All this is thematically and artistically like building a picture for me. Yeah, and allow me to go back to the second verse here. 
and how to be of use, make the tea and the soup, and all their favorites, throw them away, and all their school books and the running shoes, washing and cleaning the dirty still sink. A routine keeps me in line, helps me pass the time, concentrate my mind, helps me to sleep. The drudgery here is, 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 is unavoidable. And then keep making the beds and keep the cat fed. Open the windows, let the air in, and keep the house clean and keep the routine. Paintings they make still stuck to the fridge. I to keep cleaning, keep ironing, cooking their meals in the stainless steel. All these lyrics are 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 they're painful to read. I mean, it's of course these are things that everyone has to do. But again, you start to get into the character here. Routine keeps me in line. It helps that I'm watching a lot of Big Bang Theory right now, so Sheldon Cooper is somewhere in there. But you know, clearly with a much more of a much more of a, a pivotal end, you know, in well, sight. I think also it's it's more to the fact that routine distracts you from distractions, so to speak. You know, if you're in a routine, you can't get stressed or worried or depressed in theory because you're in a routine. It's the thing you have to do. You have to get up. You have to have breakfast. You have to make the bed. You have to get in the shower. You have to go to work. You have to come home from work. You have to eat dinner. You have to go to bed. It's, it's Yeah, these are the kind of things that just sort of keep you from actually really avoiding life's real problems or the things that could actually get you free from the routine. It's It's... It's another irony in its sense. We yeah. keep going with this thing that is going to keep us in the same thing. It's, it's, and, and as he starts, especially after that first chorus, as he starts adding more and more and more on top of the routine, he starts building up with more instruments. He brings in a guitar. He starts pairing that with um, a little bit heavier in the string work. This this is just it's it's building up, building up, building up. Yeah, let's really talk about the the, the for that first big shift, which occurred at three around three minutes fifteen seconds. Here, where this instrumental steps in and it really opens up. I I adored this stuff. The, that slow finger picking amidst the broken you know the broken chords, shifting kind of between like B minor, more of a ninth, and also like an A minor ninth. I wasn't quite sure because again, it's it's all in the voicing here. The voicing on on in the in the that slow broken chord finger picking is, is is where it's at here amidst that we have that bass drone below us and uh, then another guitar steps in over that to offer these slight little pitch bends so everything is such so simplified here again like attention to detail and also still very very thin the nature of of doing a chore in a given day uh, and then it starts to thicken up a little bit into more of a full-fledged guitar solo here this was interesting. My only problem is that it did feel like it was maybe dragging a little bit. The rhythm was kind of numbing, as it should be, but that's one of those artistic defenses for this type of track. Sure, drudgery is numbing, but there was there was more of a, like a weak smoothness to, to this stretch here. It's more like I loved the build-up than kind of what it led to. It was the first moment where I started to, to really find a defined... Uh, prog fault as as people would see it you know like going off into that one extra thing still beautiful though well i i had no problem with this i was enjoying every moment of okay. it okay it was especially when the that that second section when the car, guitar really just comes back strong it's almost mimicking the piano but almost ironically or in, in even in a mean spirit it's mimicking the original piano that started off that the extra layers that they could start getting thrown on there, the space that gets thrown into there, which makes things seem a little bit bigger, a little bit more oppressive on top of the character. The build up, build up, build up to that solo, and that solo gets a gets almost manic. Gets a lot of that kind of guitar bravado that you expect from a solo. Definitely, that goes right into the scariest rendition the the female vocalist does. Yeah. Which, it almost comes off as a type of psychosis when she's singing. Was this at the moment when she start, goes into the, that... Routine uh, again. Keep cleaning. Keep ironing. Cooking their meals on the stainless steel hop. Keep washing. Keep scrubbing. Long until the dark comes to bruise the sky deep in the dead tonight. And that's one of my favorite lines. Long until the dark comes to bruise the sky. Beautiful imagery right there. This whole song also kind of just the, the whole structure of the routine for a song called Routine kind of shines through and through as a song arc and, and theme goes is really solid. I also like, I think around the five minute mark when the female vocal and 
Steve Wilson are singing together. Yeah, when the duet, duet, the duets were really nice, gorgeous, and and well mixed and well, they, like nobody outshined anybody. It was perfectly blended. It just the song really conveyed what it was going for. It was a very strong follow up to Perfect Life. See, I have only one nitpick, and this is kind of minor nitpick uh, early on here, and it kind of goes back to that same thing, but. It, not 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 necessarily the uh the the instrumental or the solo but maybe in her delivery of that keep cleaning keep ironing alongside the chords they're kind of still doing that like chromatic shifting there's almost like a little bit of a familiarity to the to the uh the descent into madness here that felt just a little bit on point for such a unique story. I felt like maybe this was kind of taking a little bit of the easy way out, like almost just a a cartoonish simplification of the character because it's never that simple. It's always much more complex. And I feel like he was on the right track in other places on this album in terms of, of the complexity of character like this and how you really end up in these places or how you end up stuck in a rut per se. And this one little motive was just a little bit like... It's almost like Broadway, you know, and Broadway spells things out very often. Well, there's you also got to remember at the very end of the song, he kind of goes back to form to his original theme uh, fairly heavy handedly to once again reiterate that theme of routine. And I love the way he, he full circles it. Yeah, and I also, of course, there's no disputing what you said either, Matt. I mean, around toward the end, when the two vocalists combined, I thought it had a lot, it carried a lot more weight there. Um, and then even, well, actually, that was really more somewhere toward, like right after this section, and then we have that big metal interlude, as you said, John. And amidst that, the female ste- vocalist step back in, but this time, that they're first independent before he joins in. I think it's just sort of her. You use the word cawing. Yeah, and the, that was a, 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 an amazing description of this kind of this this wailing is another way to put it. it a, it's a it real was, it's a real like a, attempt it seems to like escape the banality. It was it, it was reminiscent to me of locking yourself in a car and screaming at the top of your lungs. This idea that when you can't escape monotony and you have nowhere to go, you go to your car, you lock all the doors, and you yell at the top of your lungs where no one can hear you. That's what that kind of cawing reminded me of, this almost wailing. And that's exactly how it came off. And I, I loved the delivery there, and it packed a, more, a much more solid punch than perhaps what I had heard in those verses. And that is a very, very specific example that I don't think I've ever even heard before, though I do recognize it from a lot of romantic comedies and things of that sort. It, take, but, it takes you to a dark place to get to that point that you feel like you have nowhere to go so you have to go to your car. Yeah, and then the, and then finally there's that, that last shift where it's back to the you know the guitar feel and then this final verse or, or possibly a bridge where it's just Wilson singing here but then it does step back and forth into a duet but the last leg I think is just I think is just him. Or was that the duet? Don't ever let go, try to let go, don't ever let go, try to let go, don't ever. Yeah, that, that, that back and forth, the fade out towards the end, yeah. where everything just was starts this the to... duet help me out, or was that just the Wil- uh, Wilson? No, 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 Wilson no, no, sort no, of solitary that outro. Was, that was yeah. a solitary. Outro. And I really appreciated that. Like everything, just sort of, it's almost like a like an epilogue on yeah. the story. If anything, don't ever let go because it's, it's already faded. It feels like everything is already done here, and the damage has been done. Hence, there's something about this that came off as as very tragic to me. Yeah, I agree. From this track, we go to track six, Home Invasion. You mentioned some metal sounds in the previous track, more foreshadowing to this track, which starts with a very classic, eerie kind of intro. It's like a horror movie intro. And it goes right into heavy metal guitar work. It's got two big things that really say horror. Those high, high, long strings yep. and the heavy metal strum. Exactly. Yeah. The, str- the strings, are, I mean, are your classic. Like, there's someone around the corner, and obviously the track is called Home Invasion, so, you know, you, you, you expect that. It's, it's still a little bit on the nose. It's, again, that kind of cartoonish, like, simplification, but it's still enjoyable. And maybe he is going for more of a theatrical Broadway thing. After all, I used words like overture early on, so perhaps why shouldn't he? But, um, you know... It has a restart. It has a restart into a yes, jazz metal that, fusion? That was something I didn't expect so here. this is the track where I use the term frenetic, because the drum work, this is the most interesting drum work we got on the record. And the guitar work also is very frenetic, very energized, very kind of intensified you know this was a very intense track that of course then halfway through goes into this not bizarre but slightly unexpected funk kind of groove 
Um, this reminded me a lot of, of the Stone Temple Pilots between the way he was singing and this kind of shift from heavy guitars into this kind of funky groove. But see, how long is this track? Oh, I don't remember the Six total. and a half minutes. Six and a half minutes. It's a little longish, a longish side, but not as long as some of the things in this album. Still, we have pretty long gaps between these sections. Like, for instance, you know, you really, really... You sit with that horror movie string for feel but for not as long and then you step you're you're in drenched into that that riff it seemed like for a much longer time the yeah. guitar riff you know where everything is is that stuttered rhythm um yeah. which which seemed very, very complex chaos. i feel like it may still have been in 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 four four i'm not sure but it very well could have been something extraneous it was really more about the 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 innards of 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 that that syncopation is really what i loved about it but then it's it's the the guitar that follows that that sort of enters with that jazz funk feel that I think to me I think that John is probably my favorite part here or at least this is what I want out of S- Stephen Wilson's work because of what I know about him and what he's been able to do I see this as like the brilliance of Stephen Wilson may or may not you know really fit with the album well, I think it's still pretty much clear with the home invasion idea but yeah. it's like this is the heavier side of his work and this is where I want him to go and then alongside that, we also had the following part, the, the keyboard solo. That was incredibly funky in its own right. But then it actually has this extended riff that sort of leads you into the first verse. And this is all leading up to a completely different home invasion than what we were all expecting. We went from horror movie to kind of dystopian jazz metal fusion to a funky tone. But the whole thing is about the internet. That's what it boils down to, the internet. And his use of just just these themes to build up what a monster he turns the internet into, what a monster he turns a computer into, with download sex and download God. Download the funds to meet the cost. Download a dream home and a wife. Download the ocean and the sky. But that that's all that funk. That's all that, that heavy music going on there. The fact that he goes right from there into very light, very airy, a smooth, cohesive, almost thought process kind of a piece with the lines of, Another day of life has passed me by, but I have lost all faith in what's outside. They only are the stars across the sky and the wreckage of the night. And it's it's around that point, I mean, you step in with these, like, sweeping, rolled chords, which really is quite the contrast here. It's more centered around, like, A major, but the, again, it really doesn't do it justice with the, with, the, with the voicing in here. This is, like, this is, this was absolutely beautiful. It was a perfect follow-up. And then, of course, there's the subject matter that you're mentioning, which seems very reminiscent to, really, we only had one artist uh, in our work that, that really centered on this topic, and that was... St. Vincent. St. Vincent. And uh, Huey Newton. Huey Newton. Fourth track on the album. Still remember that. It was such a meaty discussion because of how she approached the idea of... of um, staying in... I mean, that song staying was about... In, staying, spending isolation. a winter with the internet, yeah. essentially. Being isolated in your home, stuck with the internet. Yeah, which I'm sure it probably defines many more people in this uh, 21st century world than, than we would like to admit, and probably has defined all of us in certain times in our lives. Uh, it's... it's it, it's, I think, very, very helpful that Steve Wilson incorporated this element into a 2015 album that is is based around the concept of something that happened in 2003. Again, technology is a little bit more important now, and and it it could both help or hurt, in fact. Just as we said earlier, well, technology, social media could bind you together. At the same time, it could also just make you just as isolated. Yep. And I love that he's capturing that side of it here. Um, but, but amidst this, you you do have to admit... There's something calling a home invasion. You see, like, there's really more an irony in the music than anything else, because it makes me think that the home invasion is not really real at all. The home invasion is some kind of, like, like mental state that you're trapped in. And that's exactly it. When we get to the second verse, download love and download war. Download the shit you don't want. Download the things that make you mad. Download the life you wish you had. And that line is the most telling part of the yeah, whole that was, song. I, yeah. Download the life you wish you had. The, nothing is invading but the apathy towards the rest of the light, which is personified by the chorus itself as 
the chorus is is sweet. It's airy. It sounds so hopeful, but it's really about how effed up life is, how much you've just given up hope. It's yeah. it's a it's a ruse. It's a charade. You know, it's this illusion of happiness and through the internet. Frankly, the the scary quote unquote parts of the song, the parts that are kind of rough around the edges, the verses and the and even the more introductory horror theme going on right there. It's weird that those are the safer parts of the song because we get our bleakest, we well, get our saddest in the chorus. But as I said, it was which should be happy. It was like more of an irony to begin with because that stuff stepped in there. You know that 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 heavy riff part. He sort of steps in here as like an. It leads you to believe, like, it's it's based directly off of, you know, the home invasion section. So all of a sudden there's this menace, this menace, and then the menace turns out to be something so benign. You know, like yeah. the internet, this little box sitting there on your desk. But it's also this idea with isolation. You make villains out of things that aren't necessarily the villain. The, the fact of isolation, sometimes you're keeping yourself isolated, but you build up other things in life. That they, and you convince yourself that that's what's isolating you. Yeah. A scary relationship, a friend or an enemy or an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend. You build up these things that you could overcome, but it's easier to make them these impenetrable walls that isolate you inward. Or like the routine that's got you dragged down. Or, or the internet. The, the perfect life you kind of still hold in your mind. Or, you know, the regrets that you have, such as the regret that comes in the next track. Yes. So regret number nine is the seventh track, not the ninth track, so don't get confused. This one is <laughs> gloriously futuristic. Well, it also is a little bit... I mean, again, it depends on whether you were sort of in that field at the time, but, like, I, I listen to a lot of Vangelis and a lot of Floyd, and, you know, this kind of does bring me back to that. But, of course, people yeah. call that stuff futuristic for the time. So it's got... Mainly all of this is owed to the, the world it's served. Uh, keyboard yeah. that steps in here with this amazing solo, just all about the pitch bending and and mm -hmm. all that stuff. It's, we get it's, sweeping. It's so attitude driven throughout, but at the same time, it's also very rambly, as as many solos are. But this one in particular, it's an instrumental track. It's sweeping. It's gorgeous. It's got it's got this massive technology feel. And when you're following up a song that was mostly focused on the internet, this was a very perfect way to go. And it kind of, you know, it did give me those feelings of Tron and Daft Punk and this this kind of technology-driven sound. But that was only the first part. Because while that first part was very cinematic, in one way, the scenery we get um, when the guitar really steps in heavily becomes very subtly threatening for me. And this subtle threat that seems to be building, it, it's it's very classically done. It almost becomes a counterpoint to the fun that we were having beforehand. Well, see, the thing is, again, it depends on your point of view. Like, I, I feel like in many cases, I really think the titles here are more on point than the vast majority of the titles that we receive. Regret number nine. You know, just one in a series of many things that led you to this point. You know, I just the titles speak so much for themselves. And then I take into account the music, and I'm, I'm looking at that, that sort of rambly solo, and I feel like it's a, it's a kind of, it, it's a kind of like, Again, that descendant madness thing, which seems a little bit cliche, but that's I believe that's what he's pursuing because you have to wonder why he would spend so much time on specific things. He trades that out, uh, for instance, for the guitar solo, which has very much the same exact character. Like, it's soloing along the same lines. It's just one one ramble for another. Trade out one problem for another, one regret for another. And it's just this, this downward spiral that's been going on for a few tracks. And I only felt that... By the guitar solo. Love the Wurlitzer. By the guitar solo, I thought that perhaps this could have been refined just a little bit, or maybe even shortened a little bit. It's that classic masturbatory guitar solo that I note a lot. Yeah, but sometimes I like masturbatory guitar <laughs> solos, and in this case, sure. I think it was... It's fair it's, enough. It's not... I mean, we're not hitting Jimi Hendrix or anything like that. I'm not no. calling him a savant in any way, but well, he's it's good. still solid. He's good. It's still solid. It's still and pretty good. And it lasts good. a while, too. This isn't a guitar solo that comes for a few seconds or even a minute. It lasts yeah. a lot longer than that. He shows off his around. finger picking to, to some extent. I mean, it's a show off. Yeah, you know, you, you expect a little bit of that on a, on a prog record as well. And also, it crescendos, too. Like, that whole guitar solo leads to this really great crescendo of the song. 
you know, the song wraps up with Rather this climax. Kind of it climax. crescendos to the great climax. <laughs> right. And that great climax leads into a very dark and depressing ending. And overall, I think that this, this guitar solo is a through line, even if it's a bit ma- masturbatory. It moves the song along to these very important moments that wrap the song very neatly. And that outro... It's it's not quite a dirge or anything of that sort, but it, it it's dark. For it's sure. a subtle reminder well, again, for that... me for like a funeral or something. Just a simple piano that's going on there. The tonal work just reminds me of an, an organ piece or a sad funeral song. Yeah, but then there was also the banjo that stepped in there, and we're pretty sure yeah. that was a banjo. It was it's again that, that was an odd sure, an yeah. odd textural choice for this track, but it it's you know. It, it, it's no wonder that he chose kind of a dirge to end to end this sort of ramble because we're kind of wrapping up at this point. You know, I think I think he's already hinted at, and again, as much as the story will tell you as it happened based on real life, we know where this is going. So we know how it ends. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this is really just kind of like filling in the meat as things kind of go downhill. There's there's no there's no escaping this point. She's 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 trapped. Hence, all of these regrets are are for naught. You know, you can try to escape as much as you want. She's done. <laughs> and the final escape we seem to get for the album, Transience. 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 I don't do words. Track 8 no, is don't. Transience. This song is, from the get-go, very ethereal and breathy. Very short, too. And this yeah. is something yeah. I want to point out right here. And yet one of my favorites for it's so brevity. striking as a song too it really did catch my attention well, first of all it captured the same delicacy as um track five routine you know just in the guitar work here i i, I really appreciated that side of it Bro- but you know just amongst all these other things here again it's that that broken guitar chords all that a- deep- accented by that creeping synth bass yeah that was yeah. what you're the gonna deep, the deep keyboard chords really kind of made a huge impact to me in this song. It added that darkness, and also the vocal doubling really gave this kind of ethereal, odd effect. Those bass notes are kind of like, they're kind of like punctures. They just step in here whoa, and just whoa. puncture through everything um, they are, after the sl- over the slow, like, you know, softly overlapping vocals. They almost remind me of the noise that you made famous by Inception, that punctuating, Yeah, I'll give here's you that. a little bit of all. It's a little bit like that. It's yeah. a little bit of all. Yeah, that's what he's putting into this song. I mean, I'm re- relating it to something that's completely different because this almost comes off as a nice. Smooth... But it's the dark, ominous chord, and we yeah. even had this in a, in a different sense. Uh, we also had it kind of with, um, you know, uh, Sufjan Stevens back yeah. in episode 139 with that that uh, Fourth of July, which was all about the death of his mother, and this was the track concerning the death immediately, and all of a sudden we had that death sound that creeps in here. It's not quite the same sound, but it's the same. It's the same concept, and it, it really is. Is that 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 moment that just you keep it keeps harping on it, so that you have to harp on it. Um, but the whole song itself comes off as as like a southern rock or alt rock kind of a piece. I mean, his vocals I keep identifying them as more of a, a classic southern rock sound for me. But all said and done, it's it's a lovely piece with a little extra flair. I will say it's not doing anything too special for me. Yeah, but those flares were pretty fantastic. I agree. I mean, let's not forget. Yeah. Like, I don't know how the hell to describe it other than using bits and pieces of what Steve told me. But there's about two-thirds of the way through the song, there's this swirling 13th chord that's almost circular that at, was at least enrapturing. It, it, it felt like to me like it was a 13th chord. Granted, I didn't sit down with this album, but, sure. you know, it, it, it's... It, fe- it, it was the flutes particularly. The flutes, yes. I think, that, that formed that. They step in here with this, like, rolling chord. So kind of like, you know, one, one, th- one note at a time. But again, as I've said many times in this album, it really is all in the voicing. That's really where you, where you capture these, these, these wholly original moments, you know, the kind of things that seem so personal and so, and so captivating. And that kind of joins that final bass accent. They ring together, and that was, was so powerful about it here. But let's take a moment here to look at the lyrics. Cut through the countries, speed through the dark. A child in a train, distressed as it departs. It's only the start. Faded green circles rounded your wrist. Her mother is frowning. It's something she missed. She fixes her hair. At the failing of the day she heard, her father always say, Remember, it's only the start. It's only the start. When she drifted off to sleep, she had the whole world at her feet because it's only the start. It's only the start. Before they fell away, it seemed to matter all the same. Because it's only the start. Only the start. I love that line. That I'm definitely going to point out. It's only the start. 
well <laughs> so late in the game to yeah. try to be professing oh it's only the start it's only the beginning it's only a new beginning enjoy life there's more to it to have it come so well especially late? considering at, at the failing of the day she heard i mean the failing yeah i never yeah. heard a day referred to as failing the sunset to go to sleep but no that's like as as pivotal of the end is coming you know the, well the, mind, the day is lost to you start again the you know, mind of this character has already cracked it's already been broken the, the madness is already seeping out this is almost tr- the, the the individual trying to reassure herself that it will be all right in the end that there is more but you also got to remember in this case the song is a very brief song for this album it's 2 minutes 43 seconds it doesn't dwell this isn't a 5 to 10 minute piece that really tries to explore anything this is more of a snapshot of the last hurrah before things really go very awry very wrong also remember the the sort of definition of transience you know the state of only just lasting for a very very short time this is like you know kind of like what we got earlier they kind of about the six months you know back in in a perfect life that she had with her friend that she called her sister you know that was transient also everything is just these 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 slight fleeting. little fleeting moments exactly um you know it it's just it's there and then it's gone and it felt like the, the track itself felt like this like it was just a a, a spur of of renewed hope, perhaps. But again, you have to look at all the all the word choice here, the imagery. A child in a train distressed. It departs, um, faded green circles. You know, the mother is frowning. You know, as she fixes it. It's 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 almost a back ton to, of negativity. Yeah, it's everything just falling away gradually, drifted off to sleep. <laughs> you know, you could take almost. It's it's very keen word choice, and it it really. Uh, puts him as a solid lyricist, which is not something that I don't think we've we've noted as much because of the fact that that we know it's being built off of existing material. Yeah. Hence, you know, we kind of take this as more of like a journalistic ex- expose. But it's not really that, because again, he has made this story his own in a sense, and it really shows his way to, to sort of breathe new life into this into this tale. From here we go to track nine, Ancestral. Um this song starts with these kind of deep beats and some guitar work. Well, it's like a drum box, really. Yes. Again. And I notice he goes back to that a lot, or at least it has the caliber of that. It's got this overwhelming, overall kind of gloomy crawl to it. This is another <laughs> noirish type of a piece that we're getting here. It's uh, it's it. There's a, some interesting flute work in it, which is nice. It's a change of pace, but overall, it's got kind of a sullen sound. It's also very sparse at the same time, yeah. so, you know, not a but, lot happening at once. This is as, as the beginning. And these sort of darker, deeper, shrouded parts eventually start to clear up a little bit here and there as the vocals step in. We're getting another part of duality going back and forth. Let me say something about the vocal quality here also, because I notice, you know, this is one way I would put it is like lo-fi. We use that word a lot, you know, just as a as a choice that a vocalist might have in post-production or, or how they deliver their vocals. But here, it's less that in that he actually sounds distant from the mic in this case. He sounds like he's calling from a distance, and I feel like there's more of like a physical manifestation of the falling away from, from life at this juncture. Um, let's look at the lyrics. Reason never seems to come to guilty men. Things that meant so much mean nothing in the end. That function is dysfunction and to hide the truth distracted by their faith ignoring every proof. A bicycle, a garden wall, a mother's call, a love is born. And after all that sleet that falls on me, in this city there are those who live alone. Twilight brings them from the gloom into our homes. And hiding there among the wreckage left behind, they see things that aren't there when they close their eyes. This is depressing shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is definitely the turn. This is the, this is the nearing the end point. You know, this is lost in a dark depression that seems hopeless and no escape. And the next lines, come back if you want to and remember who you are. These are the ones that are seem to be the most distant, the most echoing. Yeah. Yet they As come if off. He's dr- she's drifting from herself, but they come off very clear. It's a moment of clarity 
in this gloomy gloom gloom, which is the best way to describe it. Also, let's point out, the ca- the, the track is called Ancestral. You know, again, how distant can you get? Everything yeah. is just deep in the past now. There's connections, there's threads, but is are you really the same? This track um, has issues, though. I mean, my yeah, biggest let's problem, get into that. My biggest problem with this track overall on the bigger picture is it feels long. We've had a lot of long tracks on this record, but this one feels long. And the, the ominousness of it, the sullen nature becomes repetitive after a while. Well, the track mm. itself the track itself does a great job first through the first three and a half minutes. Because that's the four. vocal that's the vocal point. That's yeah. the focus point. Even the vocals themselves, the lyric work, does culminate with a little bit of a fusion between these very noir ideas and these very clear ideas, throwing like a wet blanket on the two of them, merging them together very well. And also, again, the texture. You've got the you got the the flute here that was a very nice introduction, and then it enters in with the strings that felt a lot more you know realistic. Not the the synth strings, I don't think, but but at least it sounds more real re- realistic. It, it sort of beautified the track. Um, but the vocals drop out, and this is something that he's done throughout the album in multiple places. He sings for half the album and doesn't sing for the other. Now, I'm, I'm not okay saying he with should. That, though. I'm not saying he should. But in this case, it's a clear, defined cut in the song itself. Because after the vocals drop out for me, it just becomes repetitive. It just starts... It introduces an interesting idea, but it takes it so long to really do anything with it. No, I appreciate the point of view, but I think I'm going to disagree with that. I feel like the vocals cutting out is are, are not really central to my to my issues here. The vocals are certainly there for the for the the content. Me, you get the lyrics, and you, you really don't want to miss these parts. Um, but then I think a lot of times he has moved out into very very astute solo work, very astute uh, uh, sectional changes earlier on the oh, album. Oh, I agree. I agree. But, but here's the thing. This there's actually two two moments here, and the first moment I was still think I was on board after uh, the vocals stepped out. Um, again, the strings step in there. I'm pretty sure that was after the fact, and it felt very cinematic at this point. Granted, I I, I do think that like these like cinematic callbacks. Sometimes I feel like it's too cinematic for this album um, based on the earlier styles he introduced. Like, but then again, he has that Broadway kind of leaning. So I, I, sometimes. Maybe he he p- prefers this album. I suppose like more of eighty twenty. He prefers this album to be very much just like the the conveyance of a story and less the the artistic uh, abstraction of a story. But you know, there's that part of him that wants to pursue that, and there's another part of him that I think just wants to go off as prog musician musicians do. This is where, uh, following this section, I really started to take issue after that final choir uh choiring sound in the background which was following the main verses in which he actually speaks over it and says lyrics but then there was this acquiring sound in the background and then a guitar solo and then i'll i'll introduce what we'll just flat out call part b we haven't had one of those recently usually we can define choruses verses bridges and such uh but for prog you always got to be a little bit careful and even on this album it's been easy enough but here it's a very very harsh break it starts into the whole new thing it starts kind of soft, starts kind of sorrowful. I liked it for for starters, but then it builds into this, you know, heavy sort of threatening sound that almost I got back in Home Invasion. But I don't have the context here. You know, is this just another uh, return of the the maddening of the of the the character? I feel like we've done this already. I feel like yeah. this is less I don't mean to be picky. It's really more of a music issue that I had before any of these um any of the, the theme issues started stepping in here. The music just feels like it just kind of went off. And then we re- we go back and forth. We go into a sort of what I'd call a part C, which delivers some of that soft, like, you know, delicate parts again. It's filled with texture. It's what I would liken to other uh, bands that I, I was very into uh, a couple years back, um, sort of new metal, like, avant-garde bands, uh, such as K.O. Dot or... or, or Godspeed, things, things of 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 this nature. It felt very, very attached to texture, but this was fleeting because then all of a sudden we just pivot right back to part B, and then it's just the the reprise of the the more heavy oriented stuff, and that it continues sort of to the end. It just was a little scatter scatterbrained for how how long of a track again? 
13 minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah. The longest on the album. I don't mean to be a harsh against longer tracks. We've done longer with Swans, you know, back when with like 32 minute tracks and such. Um, it's and really have... not that that bothers me. It's really more of the cohesion of your ideas. And well, when you have a track at that length, you have to do something different with it. You can't go back to A and B, A and B, back and forth. It's not going to go anywhere. And the whole the, um, routine, uh, three years older, both songs nine minutes plus. These are yeah. not, I mean, we're already used to you going long form. But here it's just, it felt like they were pieces of a puzzle that didn't quite make the whole we wanted to see. Uh, granted, of course, this is also the story that, you know, this is not a time in the story for excitement, but I really yeah. miss the excitement of track two. Yeah. You know, and, and the way he took us through all the motions there, which just seemed so so introductory. And it makes me think that part of the failing here is that this is at the tail end. But I believe if you compared them back to back, even in a setting where you didn't know one came earlier or one came later, they... they you, Unanimously, people would prefer the the first track, the the second track of the album. That is, um, this one is just I don't know. It's it, it 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 drags. It experiments, and that basically sums up a lot of people's criticisms with 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 prog, um, or or lesser degrees of it. After this, we get track ten, "Happy Returns." Um, this is a reprise of the piano melody we were getting earlier in the record, at least from the inception. Um, it's, Happy Returns is is a nice little piece of poetry as well. So it's a very pretty piano song, um, but my biggest problem is it's we're at a point now where we're hearing something that we've not we've kind of heard before. This is not anything new sound wise. He does some interesting things with it, but overall the structure of it is something we've heard before. Hold that thought. I would just like to get a positive note about this this track first, and it's again just a title observation. Okay. Happy Returns. It, I love the usage of this title in in connection with the theme. I think it's it's alone it's brilliant. We'll talk about the music in a second. But it's it's an expression that's not, you know, very common here in the US, but it's essentially, you know, one of those throwaway comments more over there in the UK is like give my regards or rather it's the answer to it. Someone sends their <coughs> regards and you say happy returns. It's almost like there there could be some weight behind it, but it's certainly one of those filler expressions, it seems to me, that we just sort of dot our language with to make life less complicated. Hence, look at the lyrics. Hey, brother, happy returns. It's been a while now. I bet you thought that I was dead, but I'm still here. Nothing's changed. The whole song does a great job of... It seems like it should be a transitionary point. It seems like the song itself is just leading you from a point A to point B. It's borrowing so heavily from other theme work and other pieces of the rest of the album. I'm just looking at the lyrics now, and I lo- I, 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 I'm poised to agree with you on many elements of the track itself, but then again, I also like some parts. I, I just think that theme-wise, this might be one of the strongest parts for me. It resonated Oh, especially greatly. in the final verse. Well, the even let's go to the second it. verse, you know, but I'm still here, nothing's changed. Hey, brother, I'd love to tell you I've been busy, but that would be a lie. Because the truth is, the years just pass like trains. I wave, but they don't slow down. I mean, the, the nature here, again, the fact that you're, you're corresponding with someone that very well could be there for you, uh, you know... Permanently, you know, your brother. All right, well, who do you go back to at the end? You go to family. But there's just this distance here, that cold distance, that happy returns, happy returns, you know, ring to me from the title, this thing that you say to just kind of keep the stray connection, but it it is so meaningless in the end. And then also the, 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 the inner shame here. I'd love to tell you I've been busy, but that would be a lie. Because the truth is, the years just pass like trains. You can't update on anything, and so why should you say on anything? That 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 shame that you carry with you, I I I, it, it moved me very much. But at the same time, of course, this is extrapolated from the existing story. I love his rendition of it. L- let's get to the music here. I I kind of enjoyed it in the beginning. I enjoyed the the return to the optimism of perhaps the the second track um again that sort of prime time drama piano sound very soft or delicate but with a sense of motion to it uh you noted john that you like the the beat work in the background that just kind of like keeps it trudging along yeah it was hypnotic but forgettable and i think that was one of its best factors you can hear it yes. and enjoy it and i really did enjoy listening to it to the whole time to have something so droning and repetitive 
be fun and enjoyable is really awesome. It was at a really great tone. But it, it faded into the background. It did become part of the scenery. Between that and the reprise-like effect the piano has, and the acoustic guitar, another revisit to the acoustic guitar that we've gotten splashed across the rest of the songs in this album, Yeah, all came together to really give a, a very nice idea. Something that was a little bit hopeful, still kind of shrouded, still kind of dirty and, and dark There's and still not a quite there. there yeah. for sure. I mean, I can't help but think, again, as we, as we reference the real event, you know, that, that, that element that I read about the presence being wrapped, you know, when they yeah. found her. I mean, that, that it's, it's rings of that, you know, that there were plans here. There were plans to be made, perhaps. And that's right there in the final verse. Hey, brother, I feel I'm living in parentheses. I love that one. That's that's a really interesting that, choice of words. I, I, that's I'm fantastic. living in parentheses. Fantastic. You step. It's a it's it's a digression from your life as it is, and that's how you see it. I mean, little do you know that years are passing. This and is, I've and I've got trouble with the bills. Do the kids remember me? Well, I got gifts for them, and for you, more sorrow. But I'm feeling kind of drowsy now. So I'll finish this tomorrow, oh. and that's the end of the oh. that's the end of the vocal work of the entire album, right there. I, yeah, that's 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 mean. That's, to some extent, that's really mean. It really is mean. I mean, I I, I am not going to spell that out for our our diligent, um, attentive listeners. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Yeah. But uh, what I want to say is, by no means did I dislike this song. It was sweet and sad, and actually truly a beautiful ra- wrap up for at least the lyrical part of the record. Um, but that said, again, it wasn't anything new. This is stuff that's heard the before. point. That's the argument I'm making here. Great, I'm glad it's the point. I still don't like, it, and I think it still kind of hurts the record a little. It. I, I I understand that it's intentional, but then it comes down to art versus music again, as we've talked before. And I just felt like I had heard this before, and there are other ways to portray sadness and sweetness. I'll agree this. Not, this is how I would it. characterize the music as a whole here uh, in this final track. I mean, it should be second to final track. Um, it develops into kind of a piano rock track with the same pop leanings that we got from track uh, three or four. Um, the probably the most poppiest track. Oh, track three. I have, yeah, the the, 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 and, uh, the title track, of course. Um, and a, there was also like other little elements here. It stepped into a little more of a southern rock side, but that's you know only something that I attribute to it. Uh, but it's it, you're right. It, it didn't step out grandly. I think really here I was just more focused on those words. Yeah. And the whole point of it was that we knew this album was going to end in tears. Yes. Absolutely. That much yeah. is obvious. But we're not talking about a violent that. death no. or suicide or something tragic, tragic in that way. This is a quiet tragedy. This is a tragedy that nobody really notices. Right. So for it to be nice and soft and. Even familiar, because this person's still going on with their life. I would not want this song to be sweeping and gorgeous or anything like that to sum up a life, because it's supposed to be that quiet tragedy that doesn't even really make a blip. That's the story he's telling here. And part of the impact is it does have a very familiar... This is, this is the character. The character is still leading her life. It's still going to keep going on exactly as it is before. Yeah, she's had her moments of madness where she ran away from conflict and things like that. That much is obvious here. But she still comes back to her same failings and and fallacies that she believed before. So it's perfect for her to, through the music, revisit everything that we've known from her as her as her lifeline, as her as her the guitar work. As the a fact piano is, work. we know the it's character. Perfect. We know the character is deluded, and we knew yeah. it somewhat from the get-go. And this is that music. That is her. So why shy away from it? It's a different type of story we're getting here. Yeah, and I also use uh, the word deluded a little more hesitantly. It's really more a matter of of intentions that, well as well as they may be, you know, are the end is not spelled out well for them. No, and it also kind of conveys an acceptance, too, with this kind of sweetness, this accepting of where this is going. Well, where it goes... I love the, you know, let me just put in... I love the instrumental yeah. <laughs> in this yeah, final... No, there's that. In this track. So we go to the final track is Ascendant Here On. Dot, dot, dot. Ellipsis. 
It's important to note. Starts with an angelic chorus. It's very symbolic. Oh, very, God. very symbolic. This is my. This is. This is too cliche for this album. It's, the last track would have been a much better close. Adding this instrumental that's very much an ascension to heaven in music form. It's only a minute and a half to two minutes long. It's very, very... It's a vigil of a kind. Um, yeah, yeah and it's just, actually I can see that. But it's definitely something that, like, after you heard it, you went, ah, okay. Oh, yeah. No, That yeah. makes sense. Okay. It's all dogs go to heaven. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's that level of obviousness. Yeah. I, I agree it's a little on point. It makes... But, you know, it, a part of me was kind of like, uh, he went that far. And yeah. I, I'm okay. I'm a little bit okay with that. I mean, it closes the To perhaps the story. spell it out to other people. To other people, I I really do like I I still think that his vocal end was brilliant his yeah. final his final uh, lyric but uh, you know it really is debatable as to what music you choose to close off this story and frankly I I may have perceived other ways in which he could have gone around to other things in this album but that one thing I can't I can't think of any other way to do it. It's fair and I, I mean honestly the symbolism in the music was so strong you immediately if yeah. you've been paying I'm attention not... to the story go oh oh yeah okay I'm now sure. i get it yeah there they go but it was i mean it's almost like a rolled up newspaper just tapping on the nose for me i mean it's it's kind yeah, of but like blatant you, in this but case. like you said with the last track there was nowhere else for this to go name another direction there isn't no, this th- is the direction and i will artistically con- artistically i will concede that point yeah unless it, he was, where it was going. unless he wanted to go dun 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 and you really turn a real you know wet blanket on top of everything <laughs> else here and be mean about it and be a wet blanket there's nothing else he can do besides this ascension idea all right so we got through it yeah Wrap up time. Um, so this this album, I mean, it's funny. We all the times I think that we've reviewed, we've never really had an album based on a true story that we knew the arc from the beginning. We knew the narrative. This is a concept record for sure. The concept is about this this kind of isolation and what it does to a person. It's a fictional story that's based on a true story, but it's pulling plenty from the true story. Um, it's just so hard to rate something like that sometimes because the, the the story itself is obviously truly tragic, no matter how you look at it. The emotionality of this record, through and through, is very strong. I encourage any listener to read what they can on the real story. It's eye-opening. But the thing about this record that's difficult for me is there are definitely very strong, great, cohesive moments. But I feel like this is this is a three-act play with intermissions that are not very strong. You know, the beginning of the record is very strong. The middle of this record, the meat of it, the part that I really like the most, the middle, is very strong. And then the ending, artistically, is very strong, even though musically I felt it left something to be desired. But there are in-between moments that just kind of fall short and you wish were a little more, either emotionally, musically, both lyrically. Um, but he he conveys his concept as strong. I mean, knowing the story and knowing the narrative, it's here. There's no denying it. You can't claim it's about something else. It's and and even John said, and I also saw it a bit before knowing the story because Steve didn't tell us till we met today to record. <laughs> yeah, I like to fool with you. But 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 John and I both got a sense of this story even without listen with knowing it. And I would just point out, that's a really solid theme. Yeah. That's not the only thing we look at. Right. The thing is, is that musically, there are a lot of moments where I kind of scratched my head. And that hurts this album. Um, And also lyrically, too. I mean, as a singer, we said he's got pretty much the same pigeonhole we said about Ben Gibbard a few weeks ago. I still think he's a good singer, and also, again, you have to consider the fact that we're looking at a lot more here, yeah. um, apart from the singing, right. such that his singing is really just one element, and the lyrics are even more important than that. In that particular album, you know, we had less to look at, yes. and so we really harped on the singing. Well, also because his voice was one of the more standout-ish parts. standout parts, and even still, we were, we were somewhat less than impressed in certain instances. Um, I will stand true on even though i i like hand cannot erase 
the track as a whole is incredibly predictable and cheesy as hell. And I just, I expect better. I just expected better for a title track and something that's supposed to be a narrative. It's a title track. It's the title of the piece. I just expected more. Um, But Perfect Life might be one of the most beautiful spoken word songs I've ever heard. It's just gorgeous. And like John said, the, the woman who does the spoken word her voice is so engaging she's got a little bit of an accent that you can't quite place it's probably british but it's just a hint of enough that it's just exact it's exotic enough to draw you in <laughs> that's definitely a specific to anybody on this side of the pond who would have sure. that reaction but okay it's, it's worth it the, it's I, worth it he is a people. british musician don't forget that yeah that, that's yeah that's well, important um, to know obviously. too <laughs> i think though overall as a as a complete piece, it still falls a little short for me. I just there are moments where I wanted more, and it's it's no God sticks. I mean, it's not even close to me. But that's also because God sticks instrumentally leaned more towards a genre I'm fond of, while being within Prague still played musically stuff that I was more into. Um, I can definitely see James's possible complaints of how he's a little more pop oriented now. This guy. St- uh, Stephen Wilson. Don't say that on air. I, I don't know what he feels. Oh, he didn't tell you that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, James, if you feel I'll pull that way, I, I cannot confirm nor deny that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, final rating on this album. It's still powerful, and it still makes you think. And I think artistically, it's still very strong. So for that, I give it a 4.4. 4. Because it's not a 4.5 and up. It's on its way there, and those low points take a little bit away. But you can't deny this guy is talented and does some incredibly incredible work that will put tears in your eyes and definitely make you think. All right. Um, wow, I feel like I, I took on the character of this album so much. I feel like I should be going to last. But but no, John picked it. John picked I it, and I don't know if I would have. choice. I don't know if I would have picked it. it it's, um, and I'm, but I'm glad you did. Uh, This was a fascinating discussion, one of my more favorites in in recent history. But, of course, you know, it is because we have have the story. It's why I went through my long spiel at the outset. It really is important uh, for the album. It's it's unavoidable, and it's important for any listener, really. And this is a case where I would definitely argue, you know, know your your history. Know your your discography going in. Yeah, be Um, be happy we weren't all cagey and, like, alluding towards it and things like that, because that would have just been cheeky and something I would have done. That's true. Well, you know, always try to look up what you can of an album, although we do say at the end of the day, of course, an album should speak for itself. But frankly, you know, I think it does. I think it really, really does. And we may have gotten, if I didn't like reveal this to you guys, we might have approached this. I I sincerely believe we would have approached the same conclusion in in a more cagier fashion, but we would have come to it. And we would have uh, approached the same exact, um, those same themes, regret, loss, isolation, Avoiding and then ultimately death. Uh, well, we already discussed death in episode one thirty nine, so <laughs> let's let's try to keep this specific. I think that this is one of the most fascinating uh, themes to approach, despite the fact that it was laid out for him. I think it was of great homage for him to do, and I I kind of take back most of what I said about you know about track three and it's it's pop you know and it's a it's 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 the kind of pop that again i i just happen to notice statistically is marketed more to that demographic it's it's and i think that maybe at the end of the day that may be more appropriate because of this character i think that there is a kind of reservation with this character that i don't see really lending herself to to uh to larger things to greater um to greater concept because of course with with good friends you know you develop art further and hence you know the the more medium level pop stuff might seem just so in the right place for this type of person i think it's i think it's actually very appropriate for uh for like the sitting position that this album might take when it stands you notice it you notice it a lot because then he goes off and he does his prog thing and then it, it pursues issues that are a little bit more violent on this album like for instance the uh uh the home invasion, well, it's actually kind of ironic. It still ended up being the greatest irony I think I've perceived in, in, in a, a musical rendition of a theme of, of isolation and the destructive qualities it has. As benign as it is, it really is a destructive thing. Um, 
and the same goes for the optimism, and the same goes for all of the standout-ish points. I think I'm just more fascinated by this than perhaps uh, than perhaps the music as a whole. I agree with you on that, Matt, and it is no god sticks, and it is not going to be the next place for music. It sits in a lot of familiar territory, but it does it really well. Uh, and we don't even really get this level of virtuosity a lot. We haven't had it recently. Um, it's a hard thing to achieve alongside a great theme, and I give this album a lot of credit for that. So... I guess that really just leaves, you know, the personal opinion. I registered with this with this theme and the real story itself quite a bit, and I think he did a wonderful wonderful job with it. I have no shame in admitting on the on the on the air that I've I've dealt with a lot of these situations and I show a lot of scary similarities perhaps at times in my life to this character. It's um it's it's moving in that sense and it kind of could be the the fire under your ass. Uh that's important i think for any listener and it can very well change their life even if the music itself does not the funny thing is that originally i I had planned to almost drop this the same exact rating as you a pull point four (laughs) i think that maybe the more and more i consider the theme i I, I gotta do the thing i hate to do on 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 this album and just sort of go track by track but i'll make it really really quick there's really only three tracks in this on this album that are that are less impressive to me from a musical standpoint. That's track three, we just noted for, for pop reasons. Track seven for the more masturbatory, come on, get on with it guitar solo. And track nine for the just kind of amalgamation of everything. And track ten is kind of a draw. Um, that's, a, that's a portion of this album that still leaves, you know, a, a good chunk of it that stands out. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and put it on 4.5. I think this is fringe excellent, but it's certainly great. Well said. In Japan, and this is going to be esoteric and I'm going to circle it. In Japan, there's a almost cast of individuals referred to as the Hikikomori. Youthful men who have isolated themselves. Oh, I, know I know. You've mentioned that this actually yeah. came up on a previous episode. Yeah. Yes. They, uh, they lock themselves in their bedrooms. They've ignored the world and live online. And I know the episode. Yeah. Episode 86, in which we discussed St. Vincent's Huey Newton, which yeah. covered the, a similar topic. Once again, I have to bring it up, but this is an album not dedicated to just the woman that inspired it, but dedicated to those individuals who are retreating from society. It's a profound idea. It's an amazing story to tell because one person who can look at this and see themselves reflected might make the changes that would bring them further into society, that would break them out of their shell. An incredible theme, which is backed up by not the strongest of arcs. The music breaks down. That's my big complaint. It's all over the place, and song by song it's cohesive. But to be jumping from jazz and funk and heavy metal in one instance but pop in another southern in the third the story's there and that's what unifies it as a whole that's what brings everything together and makes it really beautiful but it's a little scattered it did seem like a curious like hey look what I can do yeah yeah and the music you're right doesn't really push any boundaries and that that's already just it's familiar it's it's infinitely digestible Musically, which is not for keep... every audience. I still think there's quite a bit more expansion here, but uh, it's it's a if good you start. Want it's jazz, a good start. Yeah. If you want a little bit of jazz, if you want a little bit of rock and roll, if you want a little bit of country, you're gonna get it here. Yeah, yeah. it'll it'll give you the uh, the opening up themes from here and there. I didn't see many problems with it. I probably saw less problems than you two, but at the same time. I just, I just think that the lack of cohesion in its general th- arc is what's going to really detract it. So I'm going to go a bit lower. I'm going 4.25. It's really good and it's a great story, but it's really, it's, it's musically, it doesn't push any upper echelons. Even the most masturbatory of the guitar is still something that I can, that I've like, hey, I've heard that before, back from music from the 70s. I toyed with that rating. It'll average out. I'm happy. <laughs> this al- But you make a good point, John. This album does fuse a lot of different things together. And, I mean, we've touched on, on genre fusion before. 
Um, Robert's mentioned it. We've mentioned it. The Wasties have mentioned it. We've talked about it because we, we have had a lot of other bands who kind of like to mix it up. But this might be the one of the wider ranges of genres within one album, but not that far in for Prague. I mean, Prague tends to do that more than most, I feel. In a way, Prague is really the binding, uh, the binding element. It, it's the avenue through which he can systematically pull all of these things and really not feel any guilt, you know, in the way that probably many other artists would feel like, oh, am I leaving my sound? Do my fans feel, feel against me? As a, most Prague fans like this stuff. They like the experimentation. They like the fact that, that um, an artist will extend his reach and his virtuosity to other things. But eventually, when you start just throwing things together and pushing them together and pushing them together, it blends too much. You make new genres. They have to be termed as new genres. But when, maybe, maybe where's that half line, of the time. though? Maybe only half of the time, though. I think the other half of the time, you end up getting something that is never wholly its own because it's permanently entrenched in the minds of listeners as two separate things. And they'll instantly recognize it as, that word you used, fusion. And thus, it doesn't become a new genre. It simply becomes, eternally in the minds of listeners, fusion. That, that doesn't lend itself always to a new thing that people just accept. It seems interesting that jazz fusion hasn't really caught on so much because some people find it as a bit of a cop-out. A bit well, because, of a campy cop out. Well, because they figure if you're a talented enough jazz performer, you don't need other stuff. You just yeah, need jazz. and I think there's also that's a little bit harsh in it of itself. I you agree. Know? I think also with this album, I mean, it's, I don't think it happened here that much, but I think you can overfuse. And the idea of if you're pulling all this stuff together, where is the actual sound in there? Yeah. Where do you find the act? Like, if you're taking metal and jazz and pop, then what is it? Like, you're just making a mishmash. Eventually, you lose all three of those elements, maybe. Well, the, in this case, we got um, some one type of guitar, one genre. Bass is another genre. Drums are a third genre. And then they flip it. They add in a when extra guitar. When did drums guitar. become a genre? <laughs> well, you can you can hear difference between a rock guitar. Uh, yes, the style. Rock the drum style pursued in each versus instrument. a jazz drum. I mean, you can you can hear those stylistic no, changes. No, I got you. Uh, at points, we had heavy metal guitar being played alongside acoustic, acoustic classic rock guitar, and hearing the two, and they were very well done in two different ears, was kind of trippy. But doing that, I, I see as a little bit of a cop-out. If you want jazz in your music, don't just give the bass the jazz roll, or the guitar the jazz roll, or horn that sounds like it's from jazz. So you are almost roll. taking that claim, then, the, the, the concept that, um, you know, well, if you're good enough at one thing, then go balls to the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Mm. And, but, but the other thing is... I don't know, I don't though. I still just... maintain that that's a little bit too harsh. It's more the question of, of, of execution, you know? It's too easy to say, like, all right, well, let's divide up all the different instruments into, into one place or another. You take this, you take that. I, no, don't, no, think this, I saying, don't think this album was I'm necessarily that. doing that. I'm not saying that, but okay. I'm saying at, at points, one of the instruments is iconically turning towards a genre. That happened here in multiple instances, especially when he went funky or jazz. Mm. When you don't have, and it didn't really come up here, but it's come up in other music I've heard, when you don't really have the other instruments supporting that fusion, supporting that genre, when it's so deviant from what you're used to. I made the example before we even started. Yeah, you can have a jazz guitar and a classic rock bass, but when you start throwing in a techno drum section, you're going to start breaking down. The the crossovers have to be there. They have to adapt and accept to one another, and that's something that some artists just can't do very well. Uh, well, they yeah, they choose it. They they would maybe use that as an opportunity for for expression of all the things that they can do, and then they'll shift on a dime. And it's true that that can fall south. I think ultimately the the goal is if you're going to fuse things together, you need those layers that will blend it together. You have to ask yourself, <laughs> will it blend? Of. Will you be able to combine these things in a way that cohesively they'll work? That's the fascinating thing about the discussion, though, because almost the nature of fusion is that it, it blends, yeah. is that you're blending. Well, once it's blended, you know, you, there are only so many ways you can blend. If you put some, two things in a blender, they come out as one thing. Right, but does that, that doesn't mean they taste is good. It, is it a That's milkshake, true. or is it just a pile of things that are disgusting and you don't want to imbibe? Right, and then, of course, there's, but there's good jazz fusion fan, ban, fans and there's bands. 
<laughs> and then there's also uh you know questionable jazz fusion bands again people w- might recognize it as something as something campy uh the only flip side i want to put to this is really the fact that well if you don't fuse then what do you do you develop and i think that's really the thing that i more often want to see and that's that's the, the counterpoint to my opening statement about how well fusion can either go half and half you fuse something together and you you uh, reveal something that is greater than the sum of its parts and becomes a new genre. Or, fusion, thus fused, becomes more of a novelty than anything else. It becomes a, hey, look what he did with those two fascinating styles. This album is something for you to try. You know, try it on for a day and then try something else on tomorrow, but don't live with it. Uh, but then the, the flip side is, of course, develop. You know, development is something that really reveals whole new genres unto itself. But that implies that that genres are the kind of thing that like only like that are predetermined. That oh, when something becomes a genre, it has staying power for years. That's not the case though. No. Genres well, very some... often die. So is there a difference? And, and My then, question, really. Well, uh, yes, but I want to kind of roundabout come back to that. I want to go back to a different point. Fusions don't always allow the two pieces to really come together in a unified way. You're talking about you'll create new music. Yeah. But one area I say that it's a fusion, but it's kind of stagnated in that front is rap rock. Those two things have remained at odd for such a long time, even though rap rock is not by any stretch new. It's been going on for quite some time. But you can hear the rap separate from the rock in... Well, that, most of that music. Well, the difference is, mm. yeah, the rap rock was very separated. When you and then you take artists like Shape of the Dark Lord, Adam Warrock. I've talked about these artists on the on the show a bunch. Tribe One. They'll take rock and roll music, add a hip hop rhythm behind it, fuse it, and then rap over it. But Give the it elements, more dynamics. That's the whole thing. The elements of the rap and the elements of the rock still remain separate from one another. You can still pick them out. It's still just a fusion genre. I haven't really come across that point where you need to call it something else because it's no longer rap and rock. It is a true both at the same time. Oh. All right. Yeah, I guess. The problem is really how it, how it comes to, uh, to play in the minds of the listeners and of the fans. You know, again, was that something that people perceived as a novelty or was that something that really ran its course and people just simply ran out of ideas for how to express it further? Well, I think also we're at a point where if genres keep... If we keep fusing things together and keep creating these fusions of genres, eventually we'll just have one genre. Things will fuse to the ultimate. Well, pen- I was thinking well, well, genre. I was thinking about that earlier. Like in the same way, they say that you know, well, one day in the future, hundreds of years from now, we'll all become one race and we'll all look Brazilian, essentially. Yeah. Right? We, if only we could be so lucky. Yeah. Right. But um, but it's the same principle, you know. Well, it's you have one thing, but I mean, music. Of course, we strive to keep as much diversity as possible, and for sure, there's also that claim amongst uh, amongst you know geneticists that maybe we should try to keep a little bit of diversity. Otherwise, you know, we're priming ourselves up to be wiped out in the first uh, the first um, uh, pandemic that arrives. And, and even pandemic flu is going to get us in the end. Yeah, if that keeps exactly. Out. I mean, it's not going to be pretty. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing that'll keep this pandemic from affecting music will probably be the fact that we just keep coming up with new ideas. Even if we people keep, are, yeah, people are gonna keep let... adding things and adding things together and making the pot, melting pot, but we keep adding new spices to the meal. Well, for every number of people that, you know, slink back into a rut of their own, which is interesting considering the, the rut that this album uh, pursued, but for sure music can be the same exact way. People hit their strides and they stick with it, and it's considered like, ah, well, I'll just listen to this for a while, in essence, the parenthesis that is music. Um, and then they don't return to perhaps pursuing new forms. But at the same time, you know, that, that's, just, that's, just, that's just that group. There are always going to be just that one group. And for every one person who does that, there will be another person who comes with something wildly peripheral. And that's the essence of creativity, and they're always out there, no matter how much they might not be in your go-to magazine. And we've talked about this before. When you brought up the Vsauce video where he talks about would we run out of music, you know, the ultimate answer is yes, yes. no. You know, well, we won't. I mean, the ultimate answer is well, yes, maybe. The well, ultimate it, answer is that scientifically, yes, but the human race has no chance at that point. So, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Because we'll okay. all be dead by then. Yeah, well, well, we may he, actually it, continue to evolve and learn a larger range of hearing as well, which would just 
in, in, encapsulate a whole nother brand of music. Well, remember there were two tiers of that, and yeah. the ultimate, of course, is that well, if you if you break down things digitally as we do, you know, then ones and zeros will comprise everything that has ever been said, and also everything that hasn't hasn't ever been said in the history of humanity and the future of humanity, and that actually has been mapped out to a a direct number. It's yeah. been you know that's scary, but at the same time that number. Is, is really, 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 really big. Really big. It yeah. makes the age of the universe, you know, and the size of the universe seem infinitesimal by yeah. comparison. So I don't think we got to worry about that. The second tier of his point was was that uh, pop music. If you look at the trends of pop for the last, you know, for the last few decades, then if you t- look at, let's say, a sample measure in music and work out all of the different. Uh, permutations of note rhythms and note pitches, then there is a more scary close year of a couple hundred years. Yeah. But that's we're gonna get using our just that pop. We're, go- we're going to get our Brazilians at that point. That's where we get the Brazilians, yes, yeah. in terms of, but then, the you know. The homogenous Brazilians. Yeah, but then they gonna And we're, we being the three of us and anybody listening right now, are going to be the weird guys living on other continents and stuff like that that have refuse to join the pop race. That's in the space the, the, the space race at that point. They yes. choose to live on another planet and they completely secede, we'll send them to the moon. secede from Earth. Hence, their music grows differently. We can get them by catapult to the moon, right? Um, it's something slightly more advanced, but only marginally slightly more advanced than a catapult. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, why don't we jump into our spam of the week before spam. we get to what we're doing next week. Oh, so oh, Steve we... has to do a lot of talking at this point. Because oh, he's got to do spam, and he's got to announce stuff, and then he's got to keep going. Yeah, i got to squint for this one. Oh. Hey, ya uh, and ampersand, semicolon, x69 ampersand, uh, am for the per... Ampersand, hashtag, 1110, Merry Time here. I came across board amp, it really helpful, it helped me, ampersand, x74, amp, 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 I am opening to back, uh, lots of gibberish there, Omicron, UD. Omicron? Omicron, UD, aid me. Wait, wait, Omicron, what the, yeah. show me this Omicron, what's an Omicron? Omicron. See? Oh, it's Omicron. the word. I thought you actually meant there was a symbol for Omicron. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the, he wrote out Omicron, Omicron the, per CIA. Uh, which Futurama. I thought he, I thought he may have been saying like the wrong Greek letter and just calling it Omicron or something like anyway, that. Anyway, that rom- wonderful spam was brought to us by North Face Ice Jacket Depression Treatment dot info. North Ice Depression. North, North Face Ice Jacket Depression Treatment dot info. I think he's got a little bit of uh, fusion going on there. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, nope, no, John, no, nope, nope. Steve, know, so what I are you mean, bringing it's, out it's next? I like, took John's, uh, John's thing. No. Plus, like, classic rock. No. And then you're just throwing in chamber music on top of next it. Next week's episode. I am bringing on something that is a bit peripheral, but we said we were going to do it from the start, and I maintain that we're not doing it so much. I want to stick a little bit closer to the pop community in that we were, you know doing discussing today let's check it out let's see what's going on with mr sean mendez anybody familiar no no i learned of sean mendez only about two weeks ago and it was in a very interesting way i walked into the woodbridge mall with my friend walking around for a while and then all of a sudden we noticed that a flock of preteen girls are gathering around that central mall area, you know, where all the different sure. department stores branch out. Oh, and it was a shebang. And the, s- the screams from those girls over the uh, visiting, um, Sean Mendez. visiting Sean Mendez were ear-piercing. Ear-piercing. It's not a flock. It's a murder. A y- murder. Yes, a teens. murder. Uh, uh, exactly. That's okay, true. I just Look, had to point that out. True. Look up the alternate meaning of murder. Um, okay. Anyway, the album is called Handwritten, and it did not score very well on Metacritic. It oh! Was, it was in the yellow. Yeah, I know I saw But I've, I've listened, and to be honest, I've heard worse. I want to... I <laughs> no, uh, this is not... I'm not going in cold. I just perused it very vaguely, mm-hmm. and he's got a solid voice. I don't know if he's written his own albums, but he's a Canadian singer, and uh, I want to I look at him on an album scale. So what is the album called? Handwritten. By Sean Mendes. By Sean Mendes. Okay. okay, I just want to point out, Canada's been sending us not not uh, some interesting choices as musicians over the last few if years. If by interesting you mean terrible, if we're referring to Drake, then yes. 
And he's not the only one. Oh, but yeah, the, no, there's a lot of other good stuff if you look I mean, at our, no, of course. our compendium. 15 list. years ago. Well, Stone Age, I believe, were for, I, what's his name? Lily Tinker's from Canada, didn't he? 15 years ago, Maybe. we were getting much better imports from Canada. Well, I mean, I want well, to like know what's... Nathan Fillion's from Canada. He's uh-huh. one of the best imports we got. There's a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't going to name names, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I love Nathan Fillion. Uh, in terms, in terms of comedians, I can get lost too, in his just, eyes. Oh, it's just God. amazing. His Let's, voice is just. We're ending the podcast here. This yeah. is, this is, this needs to be the end. <laughs> Please run, run screaming. No, don't run. Well, take off your headphones first. You might choke yourself if you run screaming while attached to your computer. That's right, because Crash Chords is looking out for you. <laughs> On that note, music is life. And, and life, life is, is good. good. If you enjoyed this and other album analyses, topics, and guests, please subscribe to the Crash Chords podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. For more media, also subscribe to Matt's one-on-one interview series, Crash Chords Autographs. To receive emails on all new content, subscribe at the top of our homepage. Also receive updates by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. And remember, keep the discussion going, because music is life, and life is good. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the comment board below each post. Otherwise, email us directly at admin at crashchords.com.